<laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we are live at uh, Facebook. And uh, it's nine o'clock. So without further ado, let's start our party today. A uh, very good morning, everyone, and it's great to be with you all. And uh, so you all know the COVID pandemic has caused a significant disruption and hardship in uh, nearly every aspect of our life, uh, but, and it continues to weigh heavily. I'll bite all that. Thank you for your time and effort invested to us for this webinar on sediment-related issues for sustainable reservoir management. Let's make this morning not just a wonderful, but also full of a learning and new experiences. I'm Dr. Kogila Vanyanamala, fellow from Center for Environmental Sustainability and Water Security, IPASA, and Associate Fellow of uh, Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Center, DPPC at MGUTM. And I'll be your host for today's webinar. And I was also like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who are here today in our Zoom session. Also, those who are joining us via Facebook Live and our YouTube channel. We appreciate your time of your busy schedule invested with us today. As you all may know, this webinar is organized by Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Center, DPPC, from Malaysia, Japan International Institute of Technology, MGUTM, together with Japan Asian Science, Technology and Innovation Platform, JUSTIP, and Center for Environmental Sustainability and Water Security, IPASA UTM Johor. We hope you all will be able to gain new information, insights, and knowledge from our program today, as we have lined up for you a fruitful and engaging webinar. I would like to start this event by taking a moment to offer prayers and gratitude to Almighty God for a smooth event. Let's take a moment to say prayers in our respective beliefs. To begin this program, uh, we are pleased to have Associate Professor Dr. Sohe Masura from Malaysian Japan Inter uh, International Institute of Technology, MGUTM, whom is also the Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA expert and disaster risk reduction advisor for MG. Associate Professor Dr. Sohe Masura, the virtual floor is yours for the welcoming speech. Thank you, Dr. Kogirabani. And uh, my name is Shohei Matsura. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Victor. Uh, as uh, Dr. Kogila mentioned, I'm the DR advisor of JICA attached to Malaysia Japan International Institute of Technology, UTM Kuala Lumpur. Um, I would like to first start off by thanking uh, our uh, speakers, uh, Professor Sumi of Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University, uh, Professor Sabri of uh, Department of Water, Environmental Engineering School, Civil Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, UTM Johor, uh, Engineer Ingu Ahmad Kali, uh, Design and Dam Division, Department of Irrigation Drainage, DID, Malaysia, and also uh, Engineer Dr. Jensen Lewis Alexander, uh, TNB Power Generation Company. Um, I would like to also uh, thank the moderators, course coordinator, and logistic team uh, to make this uh, webinar possible. And of course, uh, last but not least, all the participants uh, from research institutes, private sectors, uh, and government departments in Malaysia, Japan, and beyond. Um, so I would like to thank you and welcome all of you to this webinar on sediment issues for sustainable reservoir management, organized by MGIT UTM and co-organized by IPSA UTM Johor and Justip. Um, just to let you know that this webinar uh, is organized as part of uh, this river system management course of uh, our Masters of Disaster Risk Management program. Um, so we have our master's students also joining us, I think 24 of them from various disaster related departments. And uh, also we have international participants, I believe from Japan and several ASEAN countries through our JASTIP uh, network. Um, as our opening, uh, I'm going to make this short because we have a series of exciting uh, presentations from our experts. Um, but I uh, just want to mention two things uh, as a background to this webinar. 
Um, I mentioned that this is a webinar is part of our MDRM program, our master's program in disaster management. Um, and this program started in 2016 uh, to nurture uh, DR mid-career professionals uh, to become future leaders in their respective fields in disaster environmental management. Um, since uh, our opening in 2016, uh, we have so far around 50 graduates, uh, not only from Malaysia, uh, but also from ASEAN countries and uh, some from the Middle East. And uh, MGIT hosts this program in cooperation with other uh, departments at UTM and outside of UTM itself, uh, but also from, uh, well, JICA, of course, uh, in partnership with the Japan University Consortium consisting of 30 Japanese universities and research institutes. And uh, Prof. Sumi is one of our lecturers from Kyoto University who is supporting us over the years. Um, in relation to that, uh, we also, um, MGIT uh, is planning to organize a four-year training program with NAPMA uh, with the LEP 2.0 team on various issues, including early warning system, uh, DR policies, and even community-based disaster risk reduction in Japan, and also um, opportunity to um, visit uh, other countries in ASEAN. Uh, and we plan to invite uh, DR-related departments, local governments, research institutes, and private sector uh, stakeholders as well. So this webinar is, uh, well, one of these efforts to link Malaysia, Japan, and other uh, countries in the region uh, to establish a co-learning opportunity on various environmental and disaster risk reduction uh, prevention issues, uh, including dam management and safety. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that, uh, you know, disaster risk reduction and management uh, from point of view, uh, I'm assuming that dam management is also getting more complex day by day, possibly due to climate change, uh, new social economic developments, and uh, maybe perhaps lifespan of them itself uh, is making things more complicated. And uh, just from my personal uh, experience several years ago, I've attended the stakeholders meeting organized by Sarawak Energy in Sarawak on dam safety that addressed some of these uh, issues, various issues, including uh, those from dam operation, uh, you know, dam uh, break uh, modeling, uh, even down to the evacuation drills of downstream communities. And, and I felt that, that this holistic approach is very, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting realistic in Malaysia, as well as in other countries, I'm sure. Uh, and it's a good move to reduce risk, uh, especially from the preparedness point of view. Uh, but I think uh, we all realize that uh, we are more uh, required to work uh, and collaborate with non-traditional stakeholders uh, to dam management to be involved in the process. So again, uh, it is my wish that this webinar will be helpful to all of you uh, participating today, but also raise interest and in the facilitate co-learning opportunities along different and maybe some new stakeholders as well uh, for uh, various approaches to dam safety management. Um, I'm gonna keep this short. So. Um, I think I just want to end by, uh, again, thanking you, uh, all of you, uh, for joining us today, and I wish you all a fruitful morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Sohe Matsura, for the uh, very brief, yes, concise, uh, welcoming remarks. And uh, before I pass the session to our moderator here with, I have an um, announcement to make. Uh, for all those participants, if you have any queries, opinions, or questions to be asked and discussed during the webinar, kindly drop them in the chat conversation either here in the Zoom or Facebook Live. Our technical team are on standby to take note of your questions to be addressed to the speakers during the panel discussion session. Your questions may be answered directly either via chat or during the panel discussion. In case we could not address it today, we will email you the response by our respective speakers and panelists the soonest. Dear Dato professors, doctors, engineers, consultants, leaders, fellow friends, and contacts, I'm very eager and anxious to hear the setting session by our esteemed and experienced panelists, and I'm sure most of you are feeling the same too. And now with pleasure, I would like to introduce the moderator for today's event, Associate Professor Dr. Samsudin Sahid. 
Dr. Samsudin Sahid is an associate professor at the Department of Water and Environmental Engineering at the School of Civil Engineering, UTM. The major research interest of Dr. Sahid is climate variability and changes and their impacts on water resources. He has also developed several innovative methods for characterizations and forecasting climatic hazards and water scarcity for different Asian and African countries. Dr. Sahid has also authored for more than 200 web, in, web of Science Index Journal. And uh, so far, he has supervised up to 15 PhD students and completed over 20 research projects as principal investigator. Without further ado, Associate Professor Dr. Samsudin Said, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kogilavani. It's uh, my pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, it's a very timely issue. This uh, topic is reservoir and sediment management and some issues. Those are very important, particularly in the context of climate change and rapid land use changes that is happening in this region, especially in Southeast Asian region. So we have four experts today. They will talk uh, to our academician and to our engineer, field engineer. So it's a very good combination. Uh, two professors are Professor Ted Suasami Sumi and Professor Sobri Harun and the two engineers, one from TNB and another from DID, uh, Inku Ahmed Khalil and engineer Dr. Johnson Lewis. So uh, as, as uh, Dr. Pogila Veni told, if you have any question, you can pass it. We can, we can make a panel discussion in the end, but in the, during the session, there will be no question and answer session. I will just invite one by one, they will talk about their uh, the expert that the topic that is mentioned in the program. And then in the end, we'll go for a question and answer session. So first, I want to invite Professor Tetsui Sumi to talk about uh, his topic. So Professor Tetsui Sumi is a professor in Disaster Prevention Research Institute of Tokyo University of Japan. He graduated from Civil Engineering Department of Tokyo University. Before joining Tokyo University, he worked in, Malaysia, uh, he worked in Ministry of Construction Japan uh, during the period 1985 to 1998. There he worked as a field engineer in hydraulics and dam engineer, engineering. He was a visiting research engineer in, in the Institute of Hydraulics, Hydrology and Glaciology, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, Switzerland in 1992. He joined in the Department of Civil Engineering, where he is working now at Kyoto University in 1998 as an associate professor and working there as a professor since 2009. <clears throat> the specialization of Prof. Tetsui Sumi is hydraulic engineering, dam engineering, civil engineering, with particular emphasis on sediment management of rivers and reservoirs, environmental hydraulics, dam operation, gate vibration, numerical modeling of reservoir density current and sedimentation. Professor Tetsui Sumi participated in several national projects on the integration of sediment management for reservoir sustainability and improve river basin environment. He is very well known for his uh, participation in various international organizations like ICOL, IAHR, ISRS, and IAC. Professor Tetsui Sumi, was the chairman of the scientific committee of international symposium of ICOL Congress in Kyoto 2012. He was the general reporter of recent ICOL Congress in Vietnam, Vienna. So I just want to invite Prof. Tetsui Sumi to provide his lecture and talk about his topic. What the topic you want to talk is just this Prof. Tetsui Sumi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, very much like a kind introduction, uh, Dr. Shahid. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to make a uh, talk about uh, reservoir sedimentation management issues uh, on this uh, webinar today. Um, okay, uh, I'd like to share my presentation. Okay, um, so uh, today uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, sediment management for sustainable reservoirs. 
uh, experience from Japan and uh, Southeast Asia. Here is three, uh, like a photo of uh, uh, cross related dams in Japan is Sakuma Dam, uh, Somtun 2 Dam in Vietnam, and the Magad Dam in the uh, Philippines. Uh, today's my con uh, content is a, uh, I'd like to brief introduction about the JASTIP. Mm. Today's uh, like a chance is uh, under the JASTIP, JASTIP network. And uh, later on some sediment management issues, some guideline and uh, integrated sediment management concept and some management options. And uh, not only Japan, we have a good already started the collaboration with Vietnam and the Philippines and some conclusion and the recommendation. It's a final like a message. So a uh, brief introduction about the JASTIP. Uh, Japan, JASTIP is Japan ASEAN Science Technology Innovation Platform. So we are now in the second phase, uh, started uh, last year. So we have four groups, uh, main coordinating group and the energy and the environmental group and the bio uh, resources and the biodiversity. And we are in the uh, disaster uh, management group, we call the working package four, uh, close uh, collaboration with the MJIIT. And uh, this JASTIP or working package four program, we have uh, created this uh, uh, research group uh, with uh, all ASEAN country members, Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, other members as well. And the main uh, counterpart is uh, uh, MJIT and the Kyoto University. Uh, me and uh, Professor Takara and other members joining. And uh, we are now second phase. First phase we created uh, uh, main hub in the MJIT and the second hub in the Vietnam uh, Tudor University. And we started some collaboration with uh, all uh, member countries. And now we have phase two, more focusing and uh, common DRR issues in the ASEAN country, river basin management, this today's topic. And uh, some uh, focusing also transboundary issues, uh, river basin issues and uh, haze air pollution issues uh, like that. And uh, how to uh, make a, expand it, this, our collaboration to the next step. And the transboundary issues is uh, uh, one of the main topic is the uh, Mekong River issues and the haze issues. And uh, today is uh, common issues in ASEAN countries, how we understand the river basin, not only flood, uh, water resources. Sediment is very much like an uh, important topic for sustainable management. This is the uh, main focus of today's uh, webinar. And also some uh, discussion with uh, already started uh, cultural heritage and DRRI with uh, MJIT. So uh, I'd like to go to the reservoir sedimentation and management overview. So river basin management is like this, from mountain uh, to the river uh, basin and uh, finally uh, to the river mouth and coast. So water is a continuity and also sediment transport also should be continuity. Uh, we call the sediment routing system. But uh, sometimes we need some water storage for hydropower, flood control, uh, drinking water supply, irrigation water supply. Many, many like a human society needs water storage. So dam construction is an important infrastructure, but uh, sometimes it's trapped the sediment it means the sediment uh, uh, continuity will be uh, stopped. So, and uh, sometimes there's uh, sand mining. Uh, in Japan, uh, 1960, 70, also we have a uh, high economic growth uh, period. We take a uh, huge volume of sand and gravel from the river. And uh, because of that is a downstream area is a sediment starvation occurred like many like a negative adverse impact already uh, occurring. So that's why is uh, in Japan, uh, the river council of Japan uh, in 1997, we proposed the comprehensive sediment management, sometimes comprehensive or integrated management in the sediment routing system to combining all stakeholders, not only uh, mountain area, uh, not only dam reservoir, river manager, coastal manager, and all stakeholder 
should understand this process and to share the data and to uh, start some like, solution to uh, minimize the impact. That is an important uh, point. I will come back again in the last part. So I'd like to start some example in Japan. Uh, this is the Tenryu River. Tenryu River flowing in the, uh, in the central part uh, near Mount Fuji. Uh, and uh, this river basin is uh, flowing from north, uh, north to south, uh, finally going to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in this catchment, we have many cascade uh, dams like this. And some of them is uh, like uh, receiving the huge volume of sediment. So um, this is an uh, example is Sakuma Dam. Uh, dam here in the original riverbed and the water coming and the deposit in the pool area, reservoir area. So every year we have a basimetric survey uh, and this data is very much like a uh, let's say beautiful and uh, too easy to understand how the sediment coming and the deposit and the how, uh, oh, sorry, how make, uh, sorry, again, how making the delta forming, uh, red color showing the annual like a uh, process. So this dam is uh, uh, 155 meter, very high dams. And the delta is now is uh, uh, located in the middle part but uh, in the, uh, the future, this kind of delta is uh, like uh, progressing to the downstream and the uh, uh, water storage will be uh, lost and some other uh, problems, uh, some related problems may occur. Yeah, such kind of data is very much like uh, interesting and very much like uh, informative to understand the process and uh, what kind of like uh, actions needed uh, not only uh, one location, in the all reservoir, we should understand the process and the uh, suitable countermeasures. Okay. And uh, not only uh, like a profile, we take a sample uh, from the each section like this. We take uh, some like a uh, work coring like this. And uh, based on this kind of data, we can plot it uh, grain size distribution from upstream, middle reach and downstream. So, uh, you can understand that in the, uh, this deep area is a, a fine uh, sediment, like a clay or silt material. And this uh, yellow one is a mainly sandy material. And uh, upstream is a, like a coarse uh, gravel materials. This kind of like a sediment sorting is very much uh, like important to understand the process of the sedimentation. And uh, this data is summarized like this. So we understand the delta usually formed in the middle area and upstream and downstream is uh, this kind of sediment sorting may occur and other data also listed here. And the issue to be solved uh, regarding the sedimentation, we should consider the long-term reservoir sustainability. It means the uh, storage volume is very much keen for maintain to the long-term process. And uh, sometimes dam safety uh, too much accumulation will clog some intake structure or outlet uh, dam structure will be uh, affected this kind of like a sedimentation. That is what we call dam safety. And uh, sometimes the upstream riverbed will be sometimes aggregated, will create some like a, a flat risk in some like a local villages, uh, road access or some bridges overpassing this kind of uh, increasing the flat water level is also some uh, another risk. And the final uh, important point is downstream impact, like a geomorphology and uh, ecosystem is uh, too much affected by the sediment starvation. Uh, it means a trapping in the reservoir and not uh, suitably supplied to the downstream. So uh, I work for ICORD, International Commission of Large Dams. We have a technical committee of reservoir sedimentation we periodically summarizing the updated information. And this is one uh, like a graph, how the sediment accumulated uh, currently and uh, for future scenarios. So available storage is uh, uh, like uh, gradually reducing and the global uh, like average is uh, 1% or 0.8% like that. But uh, this situation is very much different in the country. So this guy like uh, Britain, uh, is, uh, some. Uh, 
data set is uh, listed in each country, how much uh, sedimentation rate, rate it means uh, uh, available storage uh, volume loss. And uh, looking into the Asian countries, Japan and uh, Malaysia and the Philippines and the Vietnam, Japan is 0.4 percent, but the Malaysia is a little bit more high. Philippines and uh, Vietnam is a little bit high. Some countries are more high. So this condition is very much uh, like uh, important, uh, like a message, how to understand how to solve or how to reduce uh, this kind of sedimentation rate. And uh, also this kind of data is listed in the Britain of the ICORD. If we go to the uh, 2050, uh, Japan will be available storage will be 20% uh, will be lost. But uh, Malaysia is uh, more than 40% will be lost. So almost, uh, and the Philippines is almost uh, half. So <clears throat> without any action to the build the new dams, available storage is uh, gradually on the drastically reducing. So later on, how to manage the water resources, flood control or hydropower. This is a very much important message, uh, the long-term uh, process or the long-term risk, uh, this uh, sedimentation issues. So <clears throat> uh, next part is, uh, I'd like to briefly talk about the Japanese guideline and the database issues. Japan, we have uh, uh, <clears throat> aware about this kind of risk, uh, from 1960 or so, the government Ministry of Construction uh, like, uh, proposing the necessary volume for reservoir sedimentation is uh, 100 years should be prepared from the beginning. And uh, we should uh, carefully monitor the uh, uh, annual process or annual progress of sedimentation. So those data is very much like uh, uh, collecting and reported to the central government. And this database is very much like a important uh, base, basic data and the guideline uh, to check this kind of riverbed degradation and uh, storage loss. And uh, currently almost, uh, uh, not all, but the one third of large dams is uh, like uh, reported to the central government, like this. And uh, based on this data, we can uh, plot it to this kind of like a, sediment yield map, potential map, uh, based on the actual data. And uh, which region, which like a uh, dam owner sector, how serious this kind of sedimentation. This data is uh, like uh, open to the public to understand uh, this kind of issues. And uh, each dam is uh, plotted like this. This is a reservoir age from the beginning, and uh, this is storage loss. So some reservoir is up to the 80 uh, or almost full of sediment. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, reservoir is uh, currently not so high, but gradually increasing. So next to 30 or 50 years later, uh, this uh, dam is uh, very much losing the storage. That is very much critical for water uh, resources management. So based on this understanding integrated or sometimes we call the comprehensive uh, sediment management is needed. So this is uh, again, go back to the, this concept. We should carefully monitor uh, to the upstream uh, catchment, how much sediment production is going on, how much sediment is uh, uh, progressing in the reservoir and the downstream also impact riverbed degradation and the river bend, some environment uh, like uh, very much changing and the coastal erosion. So this is caused by the uh, sediment starvation like that. And the important message, we need some monitoring. Uh, data is very much critical, uh, not only fine sediment, we need all like materials, wash load, suspended load and bed load. So in this means the monitoring device, technology methodology also improved. And the uh, important direction of the message, how to balancing the sediment transport from source to the river uh, to the coast. That is an important uh, concept. So for example, environmental issues, uh, like riverbed channel is all much changing. The riverbed materials also changing and the bed uh, uh, movement also almost stopped. Uh, because of that is just sometimes this kind of Vegetation is too much growing. And uh, based on this one is uh, 
uh, fish habitat environment is also changing too much, like uh, uh, affecting. And the river mouse issues is uh, this is the river mouse of Tenryu River. In the past days, uh, we have very much beautiful beaches like this. Uh, but now is uh, beach area is uh, too much reducing. But the cause of this beach erosion, coastal erosion is uh, primary sand mining in the past. And the uh, secondary uh, upstream uh, sediment uh, stopping, trapping. Uh, it means uh, sediment, uh, reservoir sedimentation, two causes. So now government direction is already uh, prohibited to sand mining now. But the sediment stopping is still going on. So the from now on, long term process point of view is a reservoir sedimentation should be uh, some action needed to uh, supply the sediment to the downstream. So uh, based on this concept, uh, government is uh, already uh, mapping like this, uh, each river basin or each river coast how much uh, like uh, erosion, how much degradation occurring, how much deposition in the reservoir, and how much historical, how much sand mining already taken, and uh, some sub uh, works also like uh, cross uh, related. This mapping is very much like uh, uh, important to understand the uh, issues. Okay. And uh, these uh, issues is cross related, sub area as it, uh, uh, controlling the sediment yield and the dam area is uh, uh, currently without any action is sediment just uh, stopping. But uh, with action, we can some change uh, to, to supply the sediment to the downstream. And the river area, sand mining and the river bed uh, degradation, uh, stabilizing is uh, closely related to environmental issues. And the coastal area, uh, we have many uh, other uh, impact. Uh, harbor construction and also uh, marine uh, like uh, protection work is also some closely related. Anyway, these issues should closely uh, linkage. We should uh, uh, share the information and uh, uh, collaborate with all stakeholders. Okay, so let's move to the, some actions. What kind of action can be uh, taken? Uh, in the I called uh, committee, we have uh, carefully discussing the collecting all global data set. And uh, we can summarize in this kind of like uh, uh, classification. One is the sediment re uh, reduction in the uh, upstream area. And the second one is the yellow one, how to routing sediment. We can propose some sediment passing through uh, like a route. And uh, Last one is already deposited one, how to take out, effectively take out. And some additional strategy can be proposed for this. So first one is how to stop the sediment. We have many actions in the catchment area, like uh, we call the sediment uh, protection work, or sometimes we call sabo work or sediment like uh, check dump. And uh, of course, uh, like uh, protection work is needed in the mountain area. Well, sometimes we built some small uh, uh, trapping weir just in, in upstream of the dam reservoir to effectively take a sediment and uh, excavating periodically utilizing construction material. And uh, this sediment can be nowadays utilizing to downstream supply for the environmental objectives. And the uh, routing uh, strategy, we have uh, uh, off-stream reservoir or uh, sediment bypassing. We have a good collaboration with the Swiss government and the Taiwan and Japan, uh, three like a uh, multilateral like, uh, network already created to discuss on how to upgrade the concept of sediment bypass system. And uh, we have a uh, international workshop 2015 in Swiss, 17 in Japan and 19 in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, we are sharing the important like a uh, concept and uh, good lessons. And this is one example in Japan uh, to build this kind of bypass system. This is bypass system to four kilometer, two percent uh, gradient. And uh, during the flood time is uh, from upstream to downstream, this kind of like a uh, sediment uh, uh, concentration uh, flow is guided to reduce the sediment input to the main reservoir. So this sediment can be uh, directly uh, delivered to the downstream. 
it means uh, multi uh, like effects to reduce the sedimentation in the reservoir and the downs downstream like a direct uh, supply. And another routing methodology, uh, sluicing, flat sluicing and the density current venting. Flat sluicing is like this, like a, two dams is located in Mimik Mimikawa River in the Kyushu Island. Originally only spillway in higher level, but we already removed the, the, in the center part to replace the more deeper gate. So this deep bucket is more chance to passing the sediment, original design and the new design. And uh, this is some image is a, a sediment coming, but the original design is tra trapping sediment too much in the reservoir area. So upstream flat risk increasing and some uh, storage is uh, reducing. So they will cut the center part uh, and the two more uh, passing the sediment to the downstream. So this is a very much beneficial uh, to sediment uh, passing through. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like this, cut it and uh, more effectively passing. Okay, so next one is a turbidity uh, density current venting. This is an example in the Seaman Reservoir in Taiwan. A large reservoir uh, if the high concentration uh, sediment radiant flow is uh, like accepting, this kind of like a flow is uh, entering and uh, traveling in the deep uh, reservoir area. And if we can uh, effectively open the bottom outlet, we can reduce the sediment deposit. This kind of like a methodology also very much like uh, discussing worldwide. And uh, in case of Sakuma Dam, I already uh, introduced our main concern is this uh, central part is a uh, sediment uh, sandy materials because uh, downstream uh, like river uh, coast, uh, river basin, uh, river mouth and coastal area is uh, composed by the, this kind of sandy materials. So, and the huge volume of sediment already deposited. So we would like to passing sediment to the downstream. This is the main part. So we are now proposing uh, some like uh, effective uh, like uh, dredging and uh, uh, shipping and the uh, to put the sediment downstream and uh, during the flood time is uh, this sediment will be effectively uh, discharging to the uh, supply to the downstream so this is a huge like a reservoir so it is uh, some difficulty to build the long uh, length of tunnels so we are combining several methodology to solve this problem So uh, I'd like to go to the uh, next part. Uh, let's say we call the APN project in Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, we have uh, collaborated, of course, just tip mechanism and uh, also supporting mechanism in APN, Asian Pacific Network for Global Change Research. Uh, some uh, funding is coming from this uh, mechanism. We uh, set up two uh, target basin in the Cagayan River Basin, Philippines and the Buja Tubon uh, River Basin in Betran. So our main concept is to integrate say, flat sediment management and including the sediment management. So maybe no need to explain again. So Elizabeth is trapping sediment, downstream is a sediment uh, starvation, the degradation and the coastal erosion uh, and the some flat risk upstream. This kind of all catchment uh, river basins uh, like issues to be combined. Okay, so this is target basin in the Vietnam, Buja Tubon in the cent central part. And uh, this is the uh, Cagayan River Basin in the Luzon Island uh, in the Philippines. Uh, several like, uh, target discussion, of course, including climate change and also uh, flat risk, how to uh, mitigate, but the long term water storage, water resources management issues is uh, important to sediment management. And we started some like a, a summarizing the available data. Uh, currently, uh, upstream dams are already constructed. Downstream sediment uh, uh, transport rate is too much like reducing now. And the downstream area is um, uh, some negative impact already. Bank erosion and the coastal erosion, but the sand mining is still going on. Upstream like backwater of the dam reservoir is still 
uh, or starting the huge volume of sediment accumulated. And uh, in the Cagayan River in the uh, Philippines, uh, the last, last year, uh, Typhoon Ulysses is attacking this area. So this kind of like a flat risk is very much like an important social discussion. But at the same time, we should discuss uh, in the reservoir area, this kind of sedimentation progress is too much accumulated progressing. So we should discuss what kind of solution should be so, uh, proposed. Uh, this is some um, like a sedimentation in the Magat Dam. Is a, this, Magat Dam is a very much important uh, water resources in this uh, uh, Kagayan River Basin, especially for irrigation uh, purpose. So uh, storage loss is uh, currently uh, very much progressing. So long term point of view, how to reduce the impact uh, from the catchment and how to find a suitable solution to uh, passing through the sediment to the downstream. Okay. So uh, last part is some like a conclusion and recommendation from uh, my side. Uh, <clears throat> so in Japan, uh, we have a uh, uh, new concept. New concept is we call the dam upgrading under operation because uh, we have many dams already uh, uh, almost uh, reached to 3,000 dams. Uh, almost half belong to the uh, government, MRIT, MRIT Japan, and uh, another half is belong to the hydropower company or irrigation uh, authority and the drinking water uh, public corporation like that. But uh, anyway, we have a limited chance to build the new dams. So now, what kind of new direction needed? So upgrading needed anyway. So sometimes the dam heightening or uh, connecting the several reservoirs, but the important uh, uh, actions is reservoir sedimentation management. And uh, also we should consider the climate change issues and also downstream environmental issues. These environmental issues including downstream river and the coastal issues. So, uh, government of Japan is uh, uh, proposing this kind of dam upgrading and operation, uh, both for governmental operating dams and the private uh, owned dams as well. So um, my main message today, uh, this is a good chance to uh, listen to the Malaysian case, but uh, we already started uh, with uh, collaboration with uh, Vietnam and the Philippines, other uh, countries, Indonesia as well. So our main concept is how to integrate sediment management in the river basin scale uh, should be proposed, including coastal management. And the main mission is the data collecting, uh, sedimentation progress, and the mapping of, of grossly related data, such as catchment yield, erosion rate, sand mining, the river bank, coastal erosion, and uh, how to selecting high priority river basins and uh, how to propose appropriate countermeasures, including dam upgrading to minimizing sedimentation by supply sediment downstream as well. So again, this mapping, this is a Japan case, but uh, maybe if we can collect the good data, we can propose that kind of ASEAN mapping, coastal erosion mapping, uh, uh, riverbed condition mapping and the sedimentation mapping, and the target river basin, we can propose some suitable solution as a, a demonstration or a leading project like that. Okay, this example in the Morocco, we have uh, uh, we already discussed in the, uh, through the JICA scheme, this kind of like a sedimentation progress, how much going on, this kind of like a data is very much easy, uh, uh, vis visible to understand. And uh, those data is uh, very much uh, contribute to the uh, world global community. Uh, this kind of like uh, data is uh, collected in the summarizing. Uh, important uh, key parameter is uh, capacity and uh, mean annual runoff and uh, mean annual sediment. How much water coming? How much sediment actually coming compared to the reservoir volume? And the uh, RESCON approach is also like uh, provided the World Bank group. So this uh, discussion can be uh, already started in globally. Maybe ASEAN, our uh, member country can contribute uh, this kind of like uh, actions. 
And uh, uh, this data, if we, you can provide from uh, Malaysian side, uh, we, we can share uh, with other uh, members. Uh, maybe 10 years data is very much recommended to averaging the old data. And uh, in Japan, we already created such kind of data. Uh, so we have already plotted many data and uh, some key leading project is all plotted. This is easy to understand uh, what kind of action to be suitable to sediment, the passage sediment uh, uh, management uh, options. Okay, uh, and the additional data is available in the website. A new Britain Technical Committee provided to the World Bank, uh, uh, I call the community. And also, uh, also we have a good collaboration with IHA and the World Bank. This data is already uh, available in the website. Please like uh, access this data. And the uh, uh, Malaysian case and other country case is very much, uh, I surely uh, understand to contribute these uh, actions. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your kind attention. This is my uh, like a talk, uh, of, uh, first talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tutsuisumi. Uh, it's a very nice presentation, especially it's a very pictorial one, very easy to understand. Even one not expert like me, I understood very clearly. Thank you very much. So I want to invite next expert, Professor Sobri Harun. He'll talk on uh, water, uh, climate change and water resources. So let me introduce Professor Sobri Harun. Professor Sobri Harun is a professor in water resource engineering in University of Technology, Malaysia. He receives his BSc in civil engineering from uh, Salford University, UK, MSc in engineering and hydrology from Imperial College, London, and PhD from UTN. Professor Sobri is a well known academician in Malaysia for his contribution in teaching and research in hydrology and water resources. His research and publication mostly related to hydrological modeling, river engineering, water resources management, and climate change. He's the panel member of Malaysian Quality Assurance Agency, member of IAHR and IAHS. He's the guest editor of Journal of, Journal of Water and Climate Change and editorial board member of Malaysian Construction Research Journal. Currently, he is an associate fellow of Center of Coastal and Ocean Engineering, UPM. So I, I like to invite Prof. Sobri to talk, talk about his topic, climate change and water resources in Malaysia or uh, global issue, I think, climate change and uh, water resources. Prof. Sobri. OK. Uh, thank you, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Shamsuddin, for your invitation. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers and the committee members for invitation as a one of speaker uh, for this seminar. So my great pleasure to share about my topics in the climate change and water availability. So it seems that Professor Sumi uh, uh, presented a significant uh, research in sedimentation in reservoir globally. So it's, uh, you know, uh, so I think uh, I just, uh, uh, to avoid overlapping, I just uh, focus on the climate change and the water availability. I being invited because I have experience uh, research on the reservoir operation. Anyway, because uh, I have also a subject in the uh, uh, dam engineering and also erosion and sedimentation. So I could share some knowledge on this area. Okay, so my content of um, presentation today uh, will be the introduction climate change, uh, water availability, and finally, the remarks. So uh, it's uh, more academics, I'm sorry. Yeah? So the water flows through the water cycle is driven by Earth's external energy, which is the sun. So the climatic factors of important uh, precipitation and its mode of occurrence, humidity, temperature, and wind, all of which directly affect evaporation and transpiration. So in the climate, understanding uh, Earth system sign, that is the interaction among the Earth spheres. Prof. So please, just, yes. just a little bit. You, you, you not share your slides. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this. 
Okay, I will, uh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you to remind me. Oh, this is okay, same mistake. <laughs> okay, okay. No, now I share my slide. No, it's okay, we can see now. Okay, okay, okay but share, uh, make it, yeah, yeah. It's okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so my title, I want to share with uh, everyone is the climate change and the water availability. Yeah. Uh, so the contents of my presentation today, interaction, climate change, water availability, and finally the uh, remarks. Um, so the uh, climate factors, yeah. Uh, I like to discuss water flows through the water cycle is driven by Earth's external energy, which is the sun. And then uh, the climate factors of important uh, precipitation. So that's really related to the uh, sedimentation. And it's mode of occurrence, humidity, temperature, wind, all which directly affect evaporation and transpiration. So in the uh, climate change study, eh, so understanding uh, a system sign, that is the interaction among the spheres and the event that occurs within the ecosystem allows people to make assessment and prediction of climatic parameters. So this is the uh, uh, picture that uh, normally hydrology, the hydrologists they will uh, look into, yeah? Evaporation, transpiration, precipitation. So this water cycle, yeah, uh, very important. Yeah, so the uh, climate change can be related to the water cycle. So the uh, climate change reveal itself primarily through change in the water cycle. So since the industrial evolution, there has been the anthropogenic injection of GHG emission from burning of fossil fuel and land use, mainly deforestation. So that increase dram dramatically in the atmosphere causes more heat is trapped in Earth's atmosphere instead of radiating out into space. So the hydrological changes in the water cycle are considered as the most significant impact of climate change. So when we talk about the water availability, so the possibility of supplying as needed during each period of the irrigation season depends primarily on the availability of water as its sources in the catchment. So a catchment is the area from which a particular river or lakes receive both surface flow and drainage water originating from precipitation. So the most common source of water supply for domestic industries and irrigation include rivers, reservoirs and lake and groundwater. So rivers are used all over the world as source of water supply and the flow of river fluctuate over time. So when we talk about the climate change, so there are two definition here, yeah? Uh, based on the uh, World Meteorological Organization, yeah, and then based on the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, yeah, and the climate change uh, actually the fact and evidence of climate change we can see here the global temperature rise, yeah, in a brief glacial glacial retreat, declining uh, Arctic sea ice, warming ocean decreased snow cover, extreme event, shrinking, sea level rise, and related to ocean. So the uh, climate change effect, yeah, the physical impact of uh, climate change foremost including, include globally rising temperatures of the lower atmospheres, the land and ocean. So since the mid 20th century, changes in the intensity and frequency of spring weather and climate event have been observed, including a decrease in cold temperature extreme, an increase in warm temperature extreme, an increase in extremely high sea level, and an increase in the number of heavy precipitation event in number of region. So this is the uh, uh, picture, a graph of the uh, a global surface temperature, yeah, rises, yeah with respect to the uh, 1850 to 1900, yeah? And uh, when we talk about the climate model, we need the, what we call is the forcing radiation. So the climate model can only simulate 
uh, temperatures accurately over the past if GHG are included as radiative forcing mechanism. So generally, climate model are used for simulation of future changes in climate due to increase of the GHG. So the GCM or the general situation model are mathematical model generally designed to simulate the present climate and the project, the future climate. So this is the, uh, a brief uh, uh, description of the how we could uh, carry out the climate change impact assessment. So we have the uh, uh, GCM or RCM. Uh, this one, uh, uh, this is the uh, regional climate model. And uh, we have here the um, uh, statistical downscaling. Yeah, here. Yeah. And then here yeah, we can uh, uh, select what type of impact we want to uh, show. Yeah. Uh, related to hydrological modeling, if you want to carry out the runoff, or we want to look at the sediment, or we want to look at the uh, uh, irrigation and uh, flood. So it depends on what type of hydrological modeling we use. Then we can uh, carry out the assessment yeah, based on the vulnerability, reliability, and other parameters. Yeah? So the uh, downscaling, downscaling of uh, climate change model is the procedure of using large scale climate model to make climate prediction at finer temporal and spatial scale. So to fit the purpose of local level analysis and planning. So there are two general approaches of downscaling. We have a dynamical downscaling. Yeah? It is a costly where output of GCM are used to drive higher resolution, yeah? regional climate model, yeah? with a better representation of local terrain and other condition. And another one is uh, uh, normally the student, the, uh, uh, the research student, they will opt this statistical downscaling, where the scaling are established between large scale climate phenomena observe local scale climate, yeah? And uh, we have uh, another term, we call it CMIP. So CMIP is the Couple Model Intercooperation Project. So it is a standard framework designed to improve knowledge of climate change and for studying the output of the Couple Atmosphere Ocean General Circulation Model. Uh, the, there are phases of, uh, CMIP, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase five, and phase six. Yeah. So the now we have a, a CMIP five is the most recently completed phase. And uh, the completed phase CMIP six will be in 2022. Yeah. So CMIP six, they have another term, we call it SSP. Yeah. So that is the uh, shared social economic pathway. Yeah, and this is the uh, graph. Yeah, on uh, just to describe the RCP scenario. Yeah, uh, this is the RCP 8.5. So RCP 8.5 uh, will give uh, a higher uh, CO2. Yeah, for RCP 2.6, the lower projected uh, CO2. And for the CIMP6, we try to compare, seem that CIMP6 with SSP 5, 8.5 is uh, with a uh, higher CO2. And uh, CIMP5, RCP 8.5 lower. Yeah. So the AP6 will be um, uh, higher with projected uh, uh, CO2. So when we look at the uh, uh, change in annual mean precipitation reported by FPCC 2014, we can see the uh, difference between RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5. So we can see here the changes in precipitation. So the uh, blue is a uh, positive changes, and this color, yeah, this uh, uh, color uh, negative. Yeah, negative um, changes in precipitation. 
Yeah. And uh, if we just have a look on the uh, water availability and stress, so we can see here the changes in precipitation and temperature will directly affect the terrestrial water budget combined with constant supply. Here, uh, I just when we look at the Malaysia, it seems that we are positive. Yeah, the relative change positive in Malaysia. But for in uh, about Pakistan, Iraq, here, Asia, uh, uh, near India, is uh, negative. So the relative change is negative. Yeah, so this show the climate change scenario trends in the water availability. And here, the annual baseline water stress, yeah, uh, globally, we can see. So here, uh, the stress extremely high in this part. Yeah. And Malaysia around here, it seems that the stress is considered low, uh, less than 10%. And in this part, it is extremely high. Yeah. India, Pakistan, here, yeah. Iraq, yeah, in, in this part. Um, for Malaysia, so the MMD, Malaysia Meteorological Department projected that Malaysia will face increase in temperature with several mean 2.6 degree and the rate about 1.5 degrees Celsius to 2.7 degrees Celsius per 100 years. So they have uh, done analysis for five regional annual mean temperature record that he indicated warming trend in 47 years based on the recorded data. And Nahrim, National Hydrologic Institute, they projected Malaysia will face warming trend also. And uh, it can affect agriculture, water resources, increase in magnitude of storm, increase frequency and intensity of flood. Yeah. So this is the temperature anomaly. And also the uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, player in Malaysia related to the climate change from Professor Prodolin. So he has his project on the sea clip codex C for Malaysia. What he, they have done is uh, they have done a study for Southeast Asia simulation. And uh, they projected the precipitation extreme for 21st century, 2081-2100. Yeah? And it seems that the results, uh, the 4R50 millimeter and RX one day are uh, projected to increase in frequency and intensity and uh, decrease in projected precipitation total over maritime continent in Southeast Asia. Means that the dry tendency, dry tendency, and uh, for the uh, uh, consecutive dry days, increase 30%. Yeah? Okay, so let's we go to the water availability in river reservoir system in Malaysia. So this is the, uh, like a primary storage in a reservoir. We have inflow here. Yeah, so this is the uh, storage of the reservoir. So that normally the sediment here will be the, uh, based on the Stokes law. Uh, so here will be the, uh, normally the sediment will be a uh, uh, coarse sediment. And here the sediment will be the wash load sediment. Yeah, wash load, the final sediment. Okay, so that or active storage refer to the water in the reservoir that cannot uh, be drained by gravity through dam outlet works, spillway or power plant intake, and can only be pumped out. Yeah. So the dead storage is referred to the sediment. Yeah. So dead storage allows sediment to settle, yeah, which improve water quality and also create hydraulic heat along with area for fish during low level. So this is the, uh, 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 we have here the flood control zone. And here we have a sluice way. Yeah, so this is the sediment. Uh, it active storage filled with sediment. Yeah, and useful storage is the water stop between the normal pool level and the minimum pool level. So the active or live storage is a portion of the reservoir that can be utilized for flood control, power production, irrigation, water supply, navigation, and downstream release. So if we look at this uh, hydro power, yeah. So the hydropower, the uh, power is equal to rho g q h uh, multiplied by eta. So here, uh, when we have a sediment, so the uh, efficiency of a sediment here 
uh, the technology of turbine will be less. So it will affect the uh, uh, power. And also when we have a sediment here in the penstock, yeah? So the penstock, so the heat will be reduced because of the, uh, uh, because of the loss due to the friction loss in this penstock, yeah? Um, so uh, the sediment is uh, control is very important, yeah, to make sure to ensure that the uh, uh, power can be generated optimal. I think uh, for the uh, hydro power, this will be discussed by uh, engineer Dr. Jensen. He has more information on this. Yeah. So the storage calculation for reservoir design involves the balancing of supply and demand, so that stock. Water is available at time when the outflow exit the inflow, and so that the space is available for storage when the flow is greater than the outflow. So let's we really look at the uh, briefly the reservoir system in Peninsular Malaysia: Pedu Muda Reservoir, Bukit Merah Reservoir, yeah, Sungai Layang Reservoir. So I have a, a opportunity to study uh, this reservoir because I get access to the data. Yeah. To study reservoir, we need to have access to the data. So I would like to thank Mada and also JPS. Yeah, and uh, this is the uh, Pedu Muda Reservoir yeah, in Peninsula Malaysia. And the Muda and Pedu Dam were built in 1969 under the Muda Irrigation Scheme for the purpose of providing irrigation water to the Muda area, covering 96,000 hectare to enable double cropping of rice per year. And uh, this is the Bukit Merah Dam. Yeah. And uh, as a control, uh, flood control, Bukit Merah as a flood control during the monsoon and as a drought, yeah, uh, control facility to maintain uh, water supply level for irrigation and domestic demand. So uh, it's also to provide uh, irrigation water for grand irrigation project, yeah, and uh, completed in 1960, 1906. So it is the oldest man-made lake yeah, in Malaysia. And uh, we have another reservoir, Sungai Layang Reservoir. So uh, the Sungai Layang Reservoir dam supply water uh, to those in uh, Pasir Gudang and Johor Bahru in Malaysia. So the water level at Sungai, Sungai Layang Dam has dropped yeah, to a critical level due to dry spell. Uh, it has been reported by the newspaper yeah, in 2016, 2019, uh, during a southwest monsoon and the transition, yeah. So let's we look at the what have been done the projected future reservoir inflow. So this is the projected uh, future reservoir inflow, yeah, 2010 to 2099, yeah. It is a increasing trend, and then uh, the projected future crop water demand 2010 2099. Uh, for the uh, Muda Irrigation Scheme. So it is a decreasing trend. And also we have the projected water demand for the Bukit Merah System Irrigation Scheme. It is a, a decreasing, yeah? And uh, here we have the uh, uh, Sungai Layang catchment. So we try to get the optimal, op uh, op the optimal operation, yeah? based on the uh, operation of the pump yeah, using the uh, uh, integer linear programming. So now the uh, what the uh, result that the change of pumping volume to Sungai Layang Reservoir, it is a trend of increasing. yeah. So that match the um, newspaper in future period during a southwest monsoon transition and, and season. And then a uh, trend of decreasing in a future period during northeast monsoon. So we have a true trend, two trend, yeah? increasing and decreasing trend based on the uh, season. So the uh, we have done for the uh, uh, data on climate projection based on the heat Hartley Center general situation model. Yeah? And then we have the, the study, uh, just to show the study have been done one of the students in uh, uh, Pakistan. So he uh, carried out the study, rainfall downscaling and projection, and he used the uh, uh, base grid precipitation data product. 
and uh, we try to evaluate the stability of replicating observed mask series. Yeah, we use a linear nonlinear method for downscaling precipitation based on random forest support vector machine. And then, um, so the uh, gauge based uh, graded precipitation that were used for the scale downscaling of precipitation from seven CMP5. And then we try to uh, assess the drop and plot the SPI and the severity uh, area frequency curve. So this is the uh, uh, comparison observed assembled mean of uh, RF and SVM model. And the uh, conclusion that the significant decrease in water availability in recent years, the planting season were found to be more affected by drought under RCP 8.5 scenario, particularly for drought with higher return period. And then it is necessary to search for new strategies for sustainable water management attention to the implication of the climate change. So let's we look the uh, study agriculture water stress in Iraq. So by uh, Salim Abdul Reza Salman. So he carried out the uh, also the climate change study, yeah, modeling of the climate change, and he used the GCM model. And he tried to uh, look at the uh, climate water availability. Yeah. And this is the uh, model. Yeah. And what's the uh, conclusion uh, from uh, his study that the negative impact of climate change on the uh, drought water demand in Iraq and a decreasing trend in future uh, CWA for all four RCPs for entire agriculture region. Then uh, it is necessary to search for new strategies for a sustainable water management attention to the implication of the climate change. So it seems that the uh, uh, study in Pakistan and Iraq, which mess what the uh, uh, report uh, by the IPCC yeah, globally. So what I could um, uh, conclude here is that the um, uh, rapid changes in water quantity, water availability, and water quality are not only driven by climate change, but by population growth, land use, energy choice, and the uh, global poverty. And uh, linking water cycle and earth system sign are life, water, land, and atmosphere. So it is essential to model accurately the impact of climate change on water resources. So what uh, we can see here, the impact of climate change and the global warming caused Malaysia to experience yeah, more precipitation. And meanwhile, in the uh, West Asia, like Pakistan, Iraq, yeah, from this study, uh, it needs a uh, new strategies for the sustainable irrigation water management. Yeah? And uh, for the reservoir storage, yeah, particularly in Johor, there's a decreasing trend in future period during southwest monsoon, uh, May, September, transition, March, April, and end season, and increasing in future period during northeast monsoon. So that's uh, all my um, remarks, uh, my presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Sobi. Uh, Dr. Jamsudin. Uh, very informative information or uh, talk. So uh, question answer will be in the end. So we will ask, obviously we have some question, audience have some question. We'll, we'll make the question in the end of that session. Okay. So uh, Prof. Sobri, can you exit from this, uh, uh, your slide share? That is, you can, you can, yeah, it's okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah. I want to, this, there are, these are the two academicians, they talk, one about the sedimentation and another climate change impact or on sedimentation. Now we have two engineers who have very vast experience on, in field, they're actually working on them. So first I want to invite engineer Unku Ahmed Khalil Azhar bin Unku Muhammad. I want to introduce him. Uh, engineer Unku Ahmed Khalil Azhar graduated from Department of Civil Engineering, University of Malaya. He is a member of the Board of Engineers, Malaysia. He worked in numerous engineering projects since 2004. He was QN QC engineer of Putrajaya Precinct 
18 housing project, Kuantan Pekam Highway Upgrading Project, East Coast Phase 2 Highway Project. He also worked as an assistant director of construction and design unit, Muda Irrigation Office of DID Malaysia. Uh, since 2017, he is working as a senior assistant director in dam and design division of DID Malaysia. His job is mainly safety inspection and survival, survival of DID dam. He also a member of Flying Squad for safety, safety inspection and auditing of for a 41 high risk dam in Malaysia. So uh, he's extensively involved with dam safety and uh, dam, dam maintenance and other things. So it will be very our pleasure to hear from him about his work. So I want to invite engineer Onko Ahmed Kholin, please. Okay, thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Samsudin. So first, I want to thank you, the organizer, for the invitation. It's great to have an opportunity to involve uh, in the, this uh, program. So uh, I'm gonna, first, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to talk about reservoir sedimentation issues, the issues face. So, uh, the outline of the presentation. Uh, we will go through a brief uh, introduction and then we're going to see what the current condition, especially on the JPS dam. And then we go to the conclusion. And then uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about what kind of strategy and future planning, especially for the JPS dam. So for the first slide, the in dam in Malaysia, we have 104, 104 dam in Malaysia with a total capacity up to 84 million cubic meters. 62 of them is for water supply, followed up by hydroelectric 16, irrigation 14, flood control 5, 6 or sedimentation dam 4, and lastly 3 for private or recreation dam. So under the GPS dam, uh, we have 16 dam, nine of it is uh, categorized as high risk dam, 11 large dam, uh, two of it is uh, ongoing upgrading uh, here in Timatasur dam in Perlis, another one is uh, at Bekuk, Johor, Bekuk dan Johor. And uh, we have one in ongoing rehabilitation, uh, this is for Coping Dam in Perak. So this is a location of all the our dams. Uh, we can see the biggest one is Paris with 122 million kilometers, followed up by Bukit Merah here in Bukit Merah. And then followed up by Pontian and Timatasu, which are 40 million kilometers, and now 38 million kilometers, and so on. So uh, as we can see on the map, we can see the concentration of our dam mostly in the southern part of the peninsula. And we got three of it near the, the border of Thailand, one in the island of uh, Langkawi. And this is and another one is here in uh, Perak, Bukit Merah, the oldest dam in Malaysia. And we have uh, the center of Kuala Lumpur, Batu Dam. So this is uh, what kind of uh, issues and challenges we're facing right now. So we have a lot of requests to increase our supply as the, the increasing in water demand. And we also face uh, addressing of uh, climate change factor. And also with aging them, we have a lot of them more than 50 years. And then we need to address uh, the development, especially at the catchment area and uh, near the reservoir of the, of the dams. But what kind of problem we have right now, we have reduction in storage. We have a lot of flood, flood event, and some of it has a pollution or sediment problem. We are also addressing safety risks, and also we spend higher on operation and maintenance costs nowadays. So what we can consider the dam is uh, sustainable when somehow the benefit from the dam is uh, 
outweigh the cost. We have should have uh, them that can have sustainability ecosystem. We have a uh, benefit for maybe for agriculture. We have to have a uh, reliable water supply. We can sustain the livelihood, especially the communities. Depends on the reservoir. And then especially on the flood control. So this is uh, what we, we call it non cost the original cost of building the dam capital cost. And also we need to balance it uh, with operation and maintenance cost. So this benefit somehow can be related to values, either in economic, in social, uh, political, or maybe in the environmental. So this is what we can see a few, what is a storage zone in the reservoir. So this is uh, somehow we call it as a beneficial zone that we have here in under here is a IP storage that should have uh, enough storage for irrigation, water supply, recreation, fishery, or the environmental flow. And then we have up here, usually up to this uh, spillway crest that we have uh, maximum full level, it's a flood control level. So this is the current status right now for the GPS dam. Initially, we have 460 million cubic meters, but in survey done in year 2013, we found out that the storage has been reduced down to 17 percent to 383 million cubic meters, and uh, we expect maybe in the near future there's going to be more reduction in the storage. So this is a few example of uh, what happened in uh, our dams right now. This is a reservoir capacity loss in uh, in uh, empty storage by percentage, uh, last by done by survey in 2013. So we found out that the Bukit Merah Dam, the oldest dam, has lost nearly 21 percent. Anak Ndau has lost the empty storage up to 30 38 percent, more than half in Pontian Dam. The code dam is down uh, is up to 18%. And the youngest dam in uh, under JPS at Burris Dam also lost 3%. So I'm gonna give you some few examples. This is uh, Bukit Merah Dam, the oldest dam. It's been built in 1906 and it was uh, upgraded in 1965 to increase the storage. Uh, the type of dam is a hom modified homogeneous earth field embankment. It's supposed to have uh, to purposely for irrigation, flood control, water supply, aquaculture, and some recreation. So this is uh, Bukit Merah capacity right now. So uh, this is uh, inclusive of uh, flood, flood storage. Should be at elevation 9.14. Should have originally have uh, around 93 million cubic meters, but in survey done in 1985, there has no huge uh, difference. But in 2013, it was down. It was down to 36 percent, just shy of 60 million cubic meters. So we can see here, the LT storage, it should be at elevation 8.69, should have 64 million cubic meters. So we can conclude that this, this, um, this dam has no enough storage either for uh, supply for irrigation or water supply, and also have a uh, limited storage for flood control. And then we have this one is a dead storage. From the survey, we have known that the dead storage already already full. So this is what we get from the Google Earth. That if you can all see that there has been a lot of changes, uh, changes in the reservoir area, especially near the uh, river Mah or Sungai Kurau. In February 2013, there have been dissolving and uh, removing pit. So within this region to increase the capacity of the dam. 
And then another one here we can we can see on no November 2013 there has been a huge flood where the when we can see a lot of sediment carries uh, in the into the reservoir. And then on October 2019, we suspected there was a quick rising flood that carries also sediment further into the reservoir. And also then we can see that a uh, lot of deposit here and erosion here at the, these two, two areas. And lastly, in, those, in December 2020, we can see the delta forming at these uh, regions. This is the dams. Another one, you can say this is, uh, we have the spillway here. So this is what we come up with in the survey we just recently uh, done uh, in this year. So we can see the changes in contour under the, under the level of the water. So we can see this uh, contour is moving towards the, the body of the dams. Uh, for example, this uh, we can see this contour of six elevation six meters here that moving further and further, and then we can see this uh, area near the dams has been larger because of the sediment uh, sediment deposit, and we can see also there have been less less storage in the deeper area. So here we can see the pictures. Clearly, we can see the, the sand entering uh, densely murky water entering the, uh, the reservoir. So from the survey, we can see there was an increase of up to 0.3 meter in average. With the higher elevation, we can found uh, in this area up to 7.86 meters compared to the normal pool level of 8.69, less than one meter. So we also have uh, uh, result, uh, we can see the result from the survey is increase of 0 0.1 meter in average in the deeper area. So if uh, condition not improved, we can see we gonna lose this area maybe in the maybe in five five years in, in the future. So we now see can see that flood feed the reservoir, but it also carries lot sediment at accelerated rate. So this is uh, another place down here where I, where I can uh, I'll tell you about the erosion. So we can see it's going to be wider, more area of uh, water here, but more shallow. Okay, if you uh, if we all can see here, this is uh, what uh, maybe type of alluvium that we know this type of alluvium uh, contains less coarser uh, material that can withstand erosion or a uh, wave. Uh, so when the fluctuation, we have seen that a lot more of the material eroded here, the increased turbidity and in accelerated in sediment. Here we can see another dam. This is Anna Andau Dam. We can see also reduction in flood capacity reduced to 33%. And in the empty storage, we have reduced in 38%. And also we can see from full storage level two flood storage level have been reduced to 23%. So this is supposed to be a land area that reserved for flood during uh, flood season. But we can see on the left, there has been a lot of development in the near the reservoir rim that creating shoreline that reducing flooding area. So we also uh, have found out a new plantation area also create a sediment border here higher than the original topography here. And this also a decreasing reservoir surface area. What we concluded here in Anna and Dalden, there have been five times more sediment rate compared to the design value. So on the dead storage loss, we have lost here is around 66% of that storage capacity. 
Uh, this is what we found out in the inspection that the tunnel floor was covered almost all with sand. You can see here in the picture and gravels. There are also presence of wood and log here in the tunnel floor in the intake of the uh, tunnel. So also we observe uh, abrasions and leakage, especially here in the joint of the, the first joint in the tunnel. So this allow water to come into the, the intake tower and flooded the lower area. Um, so we are also can see the sedimentation build up at, at front and at the weirs and also at the, here, at the weirs and the spillway here up to two centimeter high. And then we can see how cost, how, how the sediment here. You can see also lots and debris at the apron of the spillway. Lastly, uh, this is Pontian Dam. And this is more severe case uh, of sedimentation. We have lost 43% uh, on flood capacity, more than half on the active capacity and 61% on that capacity. Here we can also uh, look that the sediment is on the surface area that have covered by aquatic plant or some sort of algae, thus reducing the surface area. Here in uh, them also we concluded that there have been six times more sediment rate compared to the original design. This is a comparison between uh, 2015 and 2021. This you can see the blue water here, but we, then we can see how much color has been changed on the here. And there's, uh, we can see the progress in sediment near the, the body of the, the main dam. Also, we can see on the upstream level, there have been a large area covered by aquatic plant. Also, uh, here near the main dam. And also we can see on the littoral zone, there have been a lot of sediment. Also here is a safety risk that we need, uh, we are currently addressing to, that the sediment is uh, creating some sort of obstruction uh, and creating a bottleneck to the spillway that could hinder the operation of the spillway. And just to note, there have been an overtopping incident in 1987, Two years after the construction done. So what, what we can see on the three case of the dams that their beneficial storage has been reduced. And we can say that the Bukit Merah is uh, here in the category C, uh, this uh, diminishing beneficial storage where we can see the delta advance toward more the dams. And we also find out the much sediment that near the near the intake level and uh, also we can conclude that Pontian Dam and Nak Nak Dam this can be categorized as severe sediment impact where the most beneficial storage is lost and we can see that the intake obstruction and cross sediments intake in, enters the intake so in uh, Simple summary, we found out that, sedim that sedimentation has impaired dams outlets, water intake, increased dam safety risks uh, because of the sediment loads against the dam, abrasion of outlet and spillway, loss of functioning outlet or spillway, and uh, reduction in flood capacity, and eventually increasing the risk of dam failure. So we also suspect of aggradation could be happening in the near futures uh, that could uh, bring up uh, flooding in the upstream of the reservoir. Uh, we've also seen the reduction of water uh, quality and depth that could change the habitat of the ecosystem and the reduction of surface area for fishery and recreation. So simply put, we have reduced benefit. We have to have spend more in ONM. And we're also facing the higher risk. If we need something to do, uh, we want to receive the same benefit as same as the generation that 
just uh, with the new dams, somehow we need to manage and plan it. But still, we, can, we could see the cost involved if you want to sediment remove, remove, or we have to decide the, or the commissioning of the dam. But still, if nothing we, we plan, that we will reach the same conclusion. So this is a few initiative and strategy to prevent we repeat the same cycle. So we have uh, early monitoring and survey. We have research on the rivers. We have collaboration with uh, micro local universities, and we have published my dams integrated legacy management management guidelines. Uh, this one from Nahrim, and we also have special committee on dam structure safety management, and we have a uh, one pilot program integrated catchment management plan. So this integrated management plan is tied to involve all the authority committee and stakeholders uh, with the establishment of catchment management committee as the steering committee and catchment technical committee to advise the steering committee and catchment stakeholder for all the stakeholders to create sustainable management that will benefit current generation and future generation. So the objective are is recognizing all the parties, balancing the needs, creating vision at least for 20 years, and to produce some sort of plan or action in short term, and also, and lastly, to, to have an increase of water availability and improving water uh, quality. So we're going to start, uh, the first project is uh, for Machat Dam in Johor. So I think that, that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Engineer Ahmed Khalil. There's many practical issues and problems what engineers are facing. So it's a very nice talk. Uh, we have some questions. We'll, we'll uh, discuss this thing at the end of this one. We'll come back to you again, okay, in the, in the, uh, at the end. So now I want to invite uh, the last speaker, engineer, Dr. Johnson Lewis Alexander. I want to introduce him. Engineer Dr. Johnson Lewis is a professional engineer for more than 15 years. In the, uh, he has experience in power industry, mainly on power plant development and rehabilitation work. He holds first class degree in civil engineering and PhD in civil engineering from Uni 10. He obtained the best PhD thesis award at the national level for his PhD work. He worked many, many projects some of the major hydraulic development projects such, such as Ulu Jelai hydraulic scheme, Hulu Terengano hydro, hydroelectric scheme, Sekai hydroelectric scheme, large scale solar project. He worked there as a technical expert, lead engineer and advisor. He also worked in some international project. Uh, I'm going there before, before that one, I have to tell that he also uh, involved in inland capital uh, degrade, uh, uh, watch something like that, sedimentation studies in different hydroelectric projects, including Cameron Highland and Kenya hydraulic schemes. He was the lead civil engineer in diligence assessment of thermal power plant project in India and feasibility study for Bangladesh. At present, he's working as a principal engineer in TNB. He's involved with rehabilitation, modernization, and upgrading of major hydroelectric schemes owned and operated by TNB. So uh, I want to invite Dr. Jensen Lewis, please. So thank you very much, Professor. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see. Please continue. Okay. So I'll start off my presentation. Thank you very much for having me uh, here for this talk. Um, so we will be uh, jointly uh, presenting this uh, topic on effects on dams and hydropower uh, sediment impacts. I'll be jointly doing that with Dr. Aswin because she has done quite a bit of uh, research also in terms of uh, sedimentation in hydropower as well. So our topics will cover mainly uh, three items, uh, a bit on introduction, and uh, we will be presenting more of a question and answer uh, kind of uh, approach, uh, because I believe the three speakers uh, earlier have discussed quite uh, in depth about 
what are the issues uh, of sedimentation. So I uh, would think that those are quite a common issue. So we will talk about the question and then we will give the answers uh, relating to hydropower. Then we will touch a little bit on what needs to be done in the future. Conclusion. So these questions were actually discussed during a subcommittee meeting in the US, uh, which is part of the ICOL uh, initiative as well. So the topic of the uh, discussion was on reservoir sedimentation and sustainability. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the similar question and try to answer them in uh, Malaysia's context whether they are related or what are the status that we have now for uh, the areas of reservoir certification. So I think we all know uh, the dams and reservoir and what are the benefits of having them. So it depends on which industry you are. So like myself on hydropower, uh, basically dams and reservoirs are also built for hydropowers, water supply, flood control. Sometimes they also have a multi-purpose reservoir. Uh, but in Malaysia, most of the reservoirs are quite uh, designated uh, separately uh, in hydropower and water supply. So it gives the owner a bit of uh, better control uh, in terms of how they utilize the water. So ICOL has a definition of what is large dams. And uh, they are based on the height as well as in terms of the volume that you have. So so anything smaller than uh, this criteria will be deemed uh, not large dam. It could be in the medium range or it could be in a, in a more smaller uh, scale. So to date, hydropower uh, is very vital for energy supply. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the world, uh, if there is a projection that 19% of the electricity in the world will be generated by hydropower. So it's a very important renewable energy for Malaysia as well as throughout the world. So um, again, the hydropower is uh, very important for our renewable. We are setting up uh, new hydro schemes, uh, both in Peninsula Malaysia as well as in uh, Sabah Sarawak. So we're going to see uh, more in the future. So. Uh, this is a uh, work in progress, uh, surface area together with the storage. So to date, uh, the surface area for hydropower uh, encompasses around 22 million uh, or 22 billion uh, meter cube of water that's used for hydropower. So you can imagine um, uh, they are huge and uh, so they need to be taken care of. Yeah? Their area coverage is around 800 uh, Four kilometers square. This also includes the newer schemes that's in the hydropower system, which is for Ulujilai and Ulu uh, The distribution of dams uh, throughout the countries, uh, be it for hydropower as well as uh, for water supply, irrigation, and so on, has been compiled here uh, by Dr. Aswin uh, as part of the initiative of uh, my coal do a compilation of all the dams as well as their function. So by breakdown, uh, water supply still uh, has the most amount of dams and reservoirs as compared to hydropower, which is around 16. So all in all, in Malaysia, we are talking around about 104 dams and reservoirs uh, that are used for various uh, functions, uh, such as irrigation, flood control, as well as hydropower. So we talked about it, how the progression of uh, deposition of sediment occurs. So basically, in a summary, it's all about a process of entrainment, transport, and deposition. So the dam becomes a barrier for the water uh, which is flowing from the rivers and into the deposit. So because due to that barrier, all the sediments that are eventually flowing through the catchment into the river is all going to be deposited in the reservoir. So due to that, it is very important that if we uh, are going to look at the life of the reservoir, then uh, we need to know whether uh, this sediment deposition uh, are they stagnant or are they progressing or 
uh, are they reducing so all that needs to be uh, thought of so um what are the problems associated in uh, reservoir sedimentation in hydropower contacts well uh, there's a lot of them so i'm going to touch only a few of them here so one is of course sediment deposited along the intake and gates uh, can cause significant blockage into the structure so under such uh, incidents uh, sediments uh, could uh, what they call hinder the operation of a hydropower and then uh, it needs to be removed. So, so all that uh, requires a lot of efforts and uh, shutdown periods. So heavy, heavy sediment deposition on the offspring phase could cause pressures. Uh, this has been studied in some cases whether sediment do create a risk on the dam safety. So I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Uh, there are excessive bed loads uh, entering the penstock. They also could uh, create uh, efficiency problem, uh, blockages in the screens and so on could occur. So, so when uh, debris started to move uh, into the uh, hydropower system, then they create another, uh, another issues in terms of uh, operability of machines. We have seen sediment loads passing through steep penstocks at high velocity and they could cause some uh, serious abrasion problems. So that is true in some cases. Uh, but in Malaysia, uh, most of the deposition that is going through the pen stocks are more of a finer type of sediment. So yes, there are some uh, abrasion issues, but not as severe uh, as we can see in some part of Europe, so perhaps even uh, Japan. So. But the most uh, significant impact is the long-term sediment de deposition will result in uh, a loss of uh, storage. I think there were some questions regarding this in the in the chat group. Uh, uh, what happens is if you lose storage in a reservoir, uh, the dedicated allocation, whether it's for active zone or for flood storage or for sediment deposition, all these allocation of storage becomes affected. Then uh, this has to be restudied again, and there might be uh, a need to change some operational uh, conditions, uh, uh, like in this case in hydropower, and we need to look at how uh, we will route certain uh, volume of storage from there on. So, um, when, when and where uh, do this problem occur? Unfortunately, a lot of our reservoirs, um, they have very clear water. So when they have very clear water, um, a lot of owners tend to think that uh, sediments under there is not a problem. Until unless this sediment starts to show some kind of murkiness or some kind of signs on the surface, then people will tend to realize that, okay, we have a sediment problem. Until uh, that time, occurs a lot of the sediment issues go unnoticed and that can be detrimental because if the storage in the reservoir has far exceeded a certain percentage say around 30 40 percent to reverse it back is going to involve a massive cost and uh, disruption in the uh, system of which the reservoir is uh, designed for so the business as usual mindset uh, if the water is clear and there's no problem underneath uh, is there, then it's very difficult for us to know whether the problem exists on uh, the uh, surface of the water. So it needs to have some kind of uh, evaluation or assessment periodically. Um, we can see earlier, Prof. Sumi did talk about being uh, surveying uh, reservoirs for annually. So those are some of the practices that uh, we are also looking at uh, to see how the progression of a reservoir uh, loss uh, occurs so at least then we could have uh, some sort of uh, quicker and earlier mitigation measures being implemented so does safety of the dam affected by uh, this uh, sedimentation uh, the, the answer is actually yes and no uh, the reason is because the, we have seen some scenarios where mainly true for embankment dam sediments tends to deposit over the upstream phase. So when we run the stability analysis, um, we 
long term sediment deposition tends to enhance the stability of uh, embankment dam uh, due to the weight itself and uh, as it's forming another kind of a slope protection on the upstream phase. So, so, but this uh, it goes case by case. In some cases, uh, such as arc dam, arc dams, which are very, very slim, uh, could have uh, a serious issue in terms of stress uh, the upstream uh, by the uh, introduction of sediment. So, so uh, whatever it is, the volume of the sediments as well as the uh, character of the sediments need to be studied. Then only we can uh, come up with the analysis whether really the sediments are imposing a dam safety. So does the dam safety of the dam is affected? Again, this is on uh, the similar note. Long-term sediment deposition definitely results in storage loss. So we have seen also in some cases where dams are designed for PMF. So if it's designed for PMF, uh, typically the upper part of the reservoir will be designated block flood storage. So if sedimentation starts to occupy this uh, region of the upper storage, then to route this PMF through the spillway or, or, or whether it's gated or ungated, there might be a lot of difference in terms of uh, flood flow. So in some cases, frequent flooding could be seen also going through the dam. This is the absence of the storage which is required uh, to store uh, the incoming uh, flow. Okay, again, this is a example of data from Richard Reservoir. You can see from uh, the early ages uh, to most recent, uh, this uh, reservoir has also lost roughly around 40% of its storage. So, uh, when this occurs, when we are uh, doing the uh, flood routing or PMF or review for the PMF, then uh, the hazard map. Uh, has to be uh, re-looked at. There might be a need to, to see which are the areas might be uh, impacted uh, during a particular PMF or 100 year. So it has to be rerun uh, against uh, a model which uh, looks into the present scenario of a reservoir which is uh, filled up with sediment. But if you, if you tend to run it over the original case, uh, then the scenario will be totally different. So this needs to be carefully looked at. So sediment release uh, during a certain flood event, uh, we have seen uh, in some dams, uh, of course not the uh, hydropower dam uh, or dam failure such as uh, tailing dams and so on, they do uh, release flood waters together with uh, a lot of sediments. Um, these sediments are mostly released either in a form of very fine silt or very clay type of silt. So the detrimental effect of release uh, water with sediments could be catastrophic. There can be a lot of uh, uh, risk involved in terms of property, in terms of life. So that's that's why it is very important to study uh, the sediment deposition right in front of a dam uh, during a particular dam break study or so on, just to know what type of sediment we are having, whether they are stable or whether they are very fluid. So that, that is uh, important to look at as well. So spillway capacity and increased flood flow, we talked about this. So if there is a pool designated for flood, uh, and then if it's occupied by sediment, then uh, there is uh, a definite risk uh, in terms of uh, release. So each dam has to be looked at case by case. Um, Chengku, uh, he presented uh, some on the JPS dams, which has different uh, rate of storage uh, losses. So similarly, most of the dams, they, we do not have a same number for all the dams. It might vary from reservoirs to reservoir or dam to dam. So, so we need to study them uh, individually. So abrasion intakes, uh, uh, like in this case, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, this is a view of a spiral casing in a hydropower dam. Uh, 
the coloration is very good uh, brown uh, uh, coloration so initially people uh, look at this photo and say that that is actually the color of the steel lining but it's not it's actually the coating of sediment on the steel lining so the coating of the steel lining is quite consistent throughout a hydropower uh, scheme where i've done measurements uh, the thickness uh, vary uh, from dam to dam between uh, four inches five inches and so on so when this occurs there is also uh, a need to uh, what they call uh, clean them periodically whenever there's uh, uh, outages and then we could look at what are the damages uh, after cleaning that then you could see the steel line like in this case here uh, a kind of uh, peel off uh, coatings even uh, damages uh, in certain uh, steel issues if that type of uh, sediments are, are noticed so most sediments there is uh, uh, that could enhance abrasion issues are sediments which has high concentration of pots in them. So, so those are mostly uh, can be seen in sand material, sandy material. So if your uh, uh, scheme has a bit of uh, sand, then it's quite uh, good to study the quartz concentration uh, to see whether there will be uh, uh, post any uh, pressure risk. So we do see that uh, from uh, dam to dam. So if we do notice a higher concentration in the river, uh, sand having high quartz, then probably we need to design the, the coating for the steel for hydropower accordingly. If not, then uh, over time for certain scheme, which is designed for 50 years, probably after 10 years, you will see a lot of steel lining uh, having some issues. So this is a concrete uh, dual tunnel, uh, one for spillway and one for outlet uh, discharge. If you see at the spillway section, uh, this tunnel uh, actually has a quite a smooth uh, bed of concrete, but for the flushing outlet system, you can see the bed is slightly more rougher. Uh, this is because uh, the passing of higher volume of sediment, such as sand, silk, can also degrade uh, the invert of a tunnel. So this is for uh, reinforced concrete tunnel. So over time, uh, they could uh, propagate to either a deeper undermining of concrete, or even uh, in some cases, the concrete could just uh, break off uh, from the invert and cause uh, uh, more severe problem. So yes, this uh, uh, could occur depending on the type of sediment over time. So um, earthquake hazards, uh, so we do study earthquakes in Malaysia. Uh, it's not so prominent as some countries like uh, Indonesia or Japan, uh, but earthquake do have certain uh, impacts in terms of sediment itself. So some studies have been referred, they have seen how sand could liquefy into a, a more uh, slurry or, or fluid uh, sediment. So, under uh, earthquake uh, failure, then uh, these sediments will tend to also move. So they might end up having a mud flow uh, rather than a more uh, hard and dense uh, sediment. So that is also an area of interest that needs to be uh, looked at. So in most hydropower reservoirs, uh, reservoir sedimentation depicts the project benefit. So that's ultimately uh, the problem because even if you don't remove it to a certain degree uh, you, you you will get affected in terms of uh, power generation uh, as well as the cost to remove those sediments to restore back to its uh, optimum condition so removal by dredging is one of the most expensive methods uh, but those are the ones that are being used in a lot of the hydropower schemes uh, so, so that definitely affects the revenue of plant. So, in some cases, hydropower operators are also required to be strategized. It means the operational procedures uh, that are meant for hydropower scheme have to re be revisited over time. Look at how uh, we can manage uh, to live with the sediment as well as to to function for power. So again, this is the uh, storage. So similarly, uh, uh, a lot of presenters has uh, presented this. 
So in hydropower generation, the active fuel is actually the uh, middle section of the reservoirs, which are mostly used for power generation. So, so, so most of the hydropower schemes, which are large hydropower schemes, they do have flood control at the upper part of the reservoir. And so, so that needs to be also retained for future uh, mitigation for flood. So um, is sedimentation a problem in Malaysia? Uh, I think the answer is clear. It is definitely a yes. Uh, so as it is uh, throughout the world, because these rates are increasing. So sediment rates are not decreasing, uh, particularly in Malaysian case, because a lot of development are taking place, a lot of uh, agriculture, crops, uh, logging. So a lot of these things are increasing. So when they do increase catchments, which were once uh, pristine, so now have uh, really uh, gone through a, a rapid change. So um, it, it is, uh, however, not uh, studied in detail. So if there are some reservoirs which has issues, then there are some kind of uh, study being uh, conducted. So I think uh, we need a lot of these studies to actually quantify how is the risk and how, how serious is the problem. So because it's, it's all uh, by nature, so it tends to be very dynamic over time. So. So proper data and proper measurement is required in order for us to really quantify the impact of sediments in these reservoirs. So um, I think uh, Prof Sumi also talked about uh, the rate of uh, loss in the world uh, in terms of storage loss. So there are a lot of write-ups talking about uh, 0.5 to 1%. So in 2001, uh, there was uh, some study by White, which uh, actually uh, provided rate of 0.3%. Uh, uh, so we looked at a uh, lot of other data that's around uh, these figures. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are anticipating that uh, annual average storage loss in Malaysia is around 0.7%. Uh, mm. Maybe Azwin, can you add a little bit on this? Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Um, I think the rate, uh, uh, based on presentation by Prof Sumi just now, you were mentioning for Malaysia it's about 0.96%. But actually, in Malaysian case, uh, we have uh, there is a limited data in terms of the annual sedimentation rate. As far as TNB is concerned for our hydropower, we've done some calculation for uh, several hydropower reservoirs of which it varies in the range of 0 0.85 to 0.9%. But of course, the rate that is mentioned in this presentation, if you can see, uh, at the, uh, as of 20, I think the 2.1% is as of 2018. But as more, more mitigation measures were undertaken, then the storage loss uh, is reducing for this particular ringlet reservoir. But for others, I think we can conclude that the rate is in the range of 0.8% in certain areas, but some could be as low as 0.3%. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, ringlet reservoir is one of the uh, uh, worst case scenario where it's on the highland and it's on a very steep slope. So the rates are quite high. So the, the lower terrain reservoirs might have a, a lower rate. Uh, so, but yeah. we, are, we are looking at a range of around 0.7, 0.9% for hydropower reservoirs. So original plan, what was the original plan uh, put in place for this uh, sediment uh, to be managed in hydropower reservoirs? Well, interestingly, actually, uh, there's no plan for removal or management of sediments. Uh, typically, because uh, during any uh, kind of a reservoirs, uh, in this case, hydropower reservoirs, uh, the reservoir lives or the dam lives could be kept at five years. In those days, we are talking about 100 years, uh, but we have seen this has been reduced over time. Now we are seeing reservoirs uh, typically having only 25 years or 50 years. So what does this mean is a lot of these sediments that are coming into the reservoirs, certain allocation in the dead storage are allocated uh, for the inflow of sediment. 
So by that inflow, then a certain storage can be computed and the dam is designed to cater for that. So whatever inflow of sediment that's coming in, then to deposit uh, in the dead storage per se. But in most cases, that's not the case because sediments varies in sizes, they, they, their velocity also varies and settling parameters will also vary. So sometimes these sediments tend to settle at the upper part of the reservoir, some in the middle range and some in the upper range. So theoretically, uh, allocation for dead storage in a reservoir um, uh, is not working anymore. So um, that's the reason why uh, more sustainable uh, management of this reservoir is needed. Uh, rather than just allocating certain storage for so so again uh, to look at this uh, allocation by percentage over a certain period of time is important uh, then uh, a certain suitable mitigation measures uh, could be uh, managed so there was also some uh, good uh, uh, question on who is responsible Unfortunately, the responsibility uh, for managing the sediments lies with them. But of course, in recent years, we have seen a lot of regulatory agencies are also involved. They do understand sediment originates from the catchment which far above the reaches of the reservoir. So there is some constant discussion on this, on uh, sharing. Uh, some of the costs as well as sharing some of the benefits in terms of uh, management of sediments. So how uh, do we measure and how do we monitor? Maybe Aswin, can you brief a little bit on this? Okay. Uh, in principle, to measure reservoir sedimentation, the first method that is normally used is bathymetric survey using the eco sounder, either single beam or multi beam with the various measurement technique either range line or contouring method similar to as what JPS has done initially uh, in the earlier presentation uh, but in some cases the bathymetric survey tend to be um, quite expensive for especially for reservoir operators to conduct uh, entire survey of the reservoir so that's why we have to rely on sediment monitoring on the feeder rivers especially uh, we have to measure the total suspended solid bad load coupled with discharge measurement either on continuous or if it is labor intensive or costly we can rely on uh, instantaneous measurement covering um, both regions low flow as well as high flow so that uh, the uh, from the records uh, certain sediment rating curves can be developed and in addition to that, uh, with the advancement in the computer technology, we have also relied on sediment yield modeling, uh, which can be grouped into either empirical, conceptual, physically based, or even hybrid model or uh, data-driven concept. So uh, in Malaysia, we are still relying on bathymetric survey as the first uh, uh, line of measurement. So. Uh, so uh, basically, yes, we are relying on bathymetric survey, and in addition to that, to that is sediment monitoring as well as the sediment yield model. And I'll, I'll go straight to the question number fourteen: Where does the sediment originates from? I think it is a pretty much a general question of which it comes from erosion in the catchment, which is uh, predominantly uh, uh, affected by the topography itself or how steep the terrain is the climate in terms of the rainfall intensity uh, and temperature, land use or land cover activity, either it is subjected to aggressive, um, uh, for example, logging, uh, 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 agricultural activities or construction and soil type as well as uh, land cover. And it is said that, or we always refer to a, a minimum of 60% forest cover is needed to prevent soil erosion and landslides in the catchment. And we have also erosion that is due to the action of wind, uh, water, or gravity. But in Malaysia specific, we have a lot of erosion that is attributed to the activity of water. And uh, it is also known that as the eroded soil transported along the surface, it can be either in sheet, rail, 
gully erosion and eventually in stream erosion either as riverbed erosion or as uh, bank erosion so when the condition or suitable condition permits especially on the uh, downstream area such as lake or huge water body then uh, where it allows low velocity and large area this is where the position will occur so that is that explains why most of our reservoir and lakes in malaysia have started to face um, a sedimentation problem with regards to the active development in the catchment area and i think in the uh, for the question number 15 how do droughts and floods uh, affect reservoir sedimentation it is very common questions especially um, in the uh, when flood occurs we know that sediment load is very sensitive to high flow so multiple of sediment will be carried uh, or transported along the river network or even uh, at the catchment level on the surface area during flood event and uh, we have also done uh, and uh, it also seasonal variation also affects the reservoir sedimentation but it depends on the type of sediment as well as the deposition region and the amount that is being carried and we know that as flood occurs, depending on the intensity of the flood or the return period of the flood, it can also affect the morphology of the river and eventually the reservoir itself. So if you can see, we've done some, um, this can be done via simulation or from, from the uh, field measurement itself. So we can see that uh, in Malaysian context, um, the flood in 2014 has brought in multiple of sediment as what we have modeled in one of our reservoir so it can change the bed thickness or the it can cause the accumulation of sediment uh, measured by the uh, thickness of bed material uh, in the range of several millimeter several centimeters to at, uh, to at most of about one or two meters because of the large flood event that has occurred in 2014. So I think there is a need um, for us to look into the how does the extreme flood affects the reservoir sedimentation, which is in response to the climate change as well, uh, in view of the extreme events. Uh, so question number 16. So this is a very classic question being addressed to uh, most of the reservoir operators. What will happen if we do nothing? Well, do nothing is actually one of the conservative solution that can be considered, but it has to be, it comes with the um, major consequences. For example, if we do nothing to the reservoir sediment, to the reservoir that is facing um, extreme or uh, advanced sedimentation, then we can see that the lake or the reservoir can be completely silted up over a certain number of years, of which it can lead to, of course, loss of income to the reservoir operators, as well as loss of the reservoir functions for uh, multiple purposes, such as flat storage, or it can also affect the dam stability because uh, it has replaced the function of the uh, water pressure to the additional silt uh, pressure behind the dam. So, so the decision okay. has to be made. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what needs to be done uh, for an effective uh, reservoir sedimentation? So as you can see, uh, now Azmin has also uh, talked about uh, continuous monitoring. So we need data uh, to know what is happening in the catchment. And then periodically, we also need to do the survey uh, in our reservoir to see and monitor our storage capacity. So based on those informations, then um, possibly a sustainable sediment management approach could be looked at. Today, we are talking about sustainability is not to store the sediment, but route it through the reservoir to the downstream phase. Um, so, so that could be done either in several uh, ways, such as uh, bypass tunnels or by introduction of dams and so on. So, uh, volume and the size uh, of reservoirs that we are uh, managing will need to be studied case by case. Uh, again, 
Uh, another option would be, of course, uh, removal of the reservoir sedimentation here. So uh, we did some work for some hydropower scheme where we drain up the whole reservoir and we do a dry, exca dry excavation, which is uh, more cost effective rather than uh, doing the conventional wet uh, dredging. Um, so also there is, needs to be a lot of research uh, in terms of uh, what are the impacts of these sediments over the uh, hydromechanical uh, some studies have shown that uh, sediment, as you uh, noticed just now, some photographs which I showed, could affect the efficiency of the of the machines as well, as well as the surface area of a pen stop. So those are also some uh, degree of concern when it comes to uh, uh, sedimentation uh, in hydropower. So I think uh, Prof Sumi uh, did uh, touch a little bit on uh, establishment of these uh, parameters such as the capacity and also the mean annual uh, uh, flood as well as uh, mean annual uh, sediment that's going. So in this case, for one particular hydropower reservoir for Chandoro, so we did the analysis for uh, all the hydraulic as well as the sediment inflow. Uh, then uh, we could actually plot uh, a particular uh, uh, what they call uh, analysis to see which will be a much uh, a better option uh, to manage the sediment in this reservoir. So I think this needs to be expanded to a lot of other reservoirs. So we have started with we have for around five to six reservoirs. So we have the data for that. So probably we can uh, extend this to other reservoirs as well uh, to see where the reservoirs uh, stand uh, in Malaysia in terms of sustainability and also the non-sustainable one. So if any, if any case, if any of the parameters falls under the lower region, uh, then, then the uh, stakeholder will need to decide uh, whether are we going to keep the reservoir, the dam, or whether we're going to decommission the dam so those are the decisions that will come uh, as a result of uh, sedimentation uh, management. So this is also some extracts from uh, some uh, literature by uh, Mr. Morris. So there are so many ways to manage the sediment. I'm not gonna go too detail on this, but I think this was also touched. So each of these, uh, the one and number three are mostly applied in uh, hydropower reservoirs. Uh, number two is uh, being studied at various levels, uh, but uh, some we do do uh, uh, sluicing and flushing, uh, but there's still areas of uh, a lot of interest uh, in terms of uh, how do we manage uh, uh, sedimentation. And finally, the fourth one, of course, uh, we have also looked at uh, reallocation of storage um, and also probably uh, under a very worst scenario, uh, a decommissioning might be required as well, depending on case to case basis. So in conclusion, sediment is a real threat. So, so it has to be realized by all uh, dam operators. Uh, it affects hydropower, it affects flood control. It might also affect water supply. The study and the early detection on the uh, present sedimentation rate is definitely very important uh, to see whether uh, a proper formulation, formulation of a sustainable reservoir management, whether it can be established. Um, if we are at the far end of the problem where sedimentation has fully uh, tilted up the reservoir, then the removal of the uh, sediments from the reservoir can be costly and sometimes uh, unsustainable. So therefore, um, the impact of this uh, sedimentation needs to be really looked at. And today we are talking about sustainability of sediment. So, so introduction of flushing outlets, bypass, uh, newer dams, newer reservoirs, we are looking at a trend where they are fitted with more components for flushing, uh, more descenders are being introduced, uh, uh, more outlet walls are used. And also you can, uh, you saw, um, how a, a, a reduction uh, in the uh, changes in the orientation of the gates could also assist. So all those are introduced in order to have a more sustainable approach to sediment management. So of course, continuous participation uh, like this, sharing session efforts by all stakeholders, government agencies is definitely required for, for this uh, 
uh, what they call uh, effort towards uh, sustainable reservoir. So um, we also uh, have a particular uh, technical committee, uh, which I'm the chairman for reservoir sedimentation in my code. Uh, all participants here, which are uh, having a lot of interest in reservoir sedimentation, uh, are welcome to, to join us uh, uh, in this uh, committee, contribute uh, whatever that you can in order for us to get a good database of all the information regarding reservoir sedimentation in uh, Malaysia uh, in particular. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. It's a very nice talk and a lot of practical uh, issues and you answered a lot of questions there. So uh, now uh, it's a question and answer session. There are many, many questions. Okay, many participants are very interested about all of uh, your talks. So uh, I want to invite all that uh, were the expert, because there are all questions. We will go one by one, but there should be some common question to all. So first, uh, I want to ask uh, Professor Shumi one, some question. Uh, yep. Then I can go to other and come back again. So uh, Prof Shumi, I, I, you are available? You are here? Yes. OK, OK, OK. Sorry, I cannot see you. So one of the major question is that this sedimentation is management mm -hmm. because uh, there is always some activity, deforestation or land use change, something like that. They are making uh, sedimentation. So it can be assumed that there uh, may be some buffer zone in Japan or you, you put some buffer zone near the lakes and near the dam and you are taking some uh, measurement activity there to reduce that sedimentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can discuss something like that, how you do that one, if something like that is sedimentation happened due to human activity, uh, how you manage, how you find, you find them, or how you take that cost, something like that, uh, if sedimentation happened, uh, that uh, uh, dam breaching happened. So who you give responsible for that one? Who bear this cost? Something you tell, can tell about this one, this management, how you manage this uh, uh, dam sedimentation you, you manage in uh, Japan? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, usually the sediment coming from the upstream, like uh, uh, erosion. Uh, so uh, forest uh, uh, management is very much important. Mm. So uh, the more operator, sometimes government, uh, sometimes the local government have uh, like a, um, a kind of guideline how to manage, but uh, it means that like, uh, to guideline the how, how to cut the tree and how to build a safer uh, like a local road for forest management. And uh, sometimes it's planting uh, the devastated area should be replanting, a forestation is need, needed. And the uh, buffer zone is sometimes is uh, uh, not so large because uh, buffer zone should be uh, owned by the dam operator. <laughs> it is very huge cost. <laughs> anyway, mm. so, uh, so of course, like uh, some buffer zone is uh, like a like a green belt is a, it can be uh, like a, uh, designed uh, near the uh, reservoir uh, shoreline area, mm. direct uh, like impact. But the uh, all forest area is uh, cannot be owned. Yeah, mm. so like uh, government or local government management and uh, uh, forest owner should follow their like uh, safe and uh, suitable management. Uh, like a win-win uh, relationship be needed for forest management and uh, catchment management. Okay, but you find them if if they do some illegal activity or some uh, thing yeah. they did something like that, it's cost yeah. sedimentation. You find them? Ah, uh, yeah, illegal uh, like issues should be like uh, of of course like a uh, control. Mm. Okay. Mm. okay. So uh, this cost something like the sedimentation you are making some uh, uh, sub uh, rehabilitation. So this cost bear by Japan government or. Uh, uh, okay, okay. That is uh, two two ways of thinking. A government owned dams, of course, the government or prefecture government to pay, but the private uh, hydropower company it should pay mm. at the direct cost. For example, excavation and uh, like making the past tunnel. But the upstream like catchment management uh, should be collaborated with uh, government or prefecture government. Yes. So another another uh, the disputed thing that uh, 
sedimentation rate. You presented one and uh, other, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson and other presented uh, other sedimentation rate. Yes. So some of the audience asked this one that you presented one figure 2.2. So is, this, is there any source? How how you measure this one? This uh, okay, okay. Yeah, the source is uh, I called I called the uh, Britain uh, official report. Is uh, mainly like a contributor is uh, Professor Basson from South Africa. Uh, he is a main chief editor. So he like uh, uh, taken the uh, many data from the national committee, uh, including the uh, Malaysia as well, I, I guess. But uh, you, you already discussed about uh, uh, those uh, data sources sometimes uh, not covering all dam reservoir, mm, a limited source. So sometimes uh, like uh, uh, average data is not so uh, correctly uh, responsible to the all reservoir. So that we should update the data. Mm, that okay. is uh, critically important, yes. Okay, I understand that that is the question, but this is another question that uh, how frequently you think this should be updated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Japan, we have uh, like a strong guidance is a major reservoir should take this kind of basimetric survey every year. Every, every year. Okay. But sometimes now is uh, every two years also, but uh, sometimes event based. Uh, sometimes is uh, like a limited uh, like a funding in the smaller reservoir, uh, like a large flat occult. Yeah, may some sediment already deposited. So mm -hmm. in that case, it's before and after, we, sh we should check the, how they're changing the sedimentation. Okay, understand. So I'll come back to you again, because there are uh, some other questions. So yes. now I would want to go to Prof. Sobri. Uh, Prof. Sobri, this yes, is, uh, yes. yeah, uh, <clears throat> you talked about the climate change. So yes. though you discussed this thing that how climate change will affect uh, sedimentation and reservoir capacity. Okay, so uh, this is you discussed. So, uh, what do you think about Malaysia? That how it will, how severe it can be. So, and how it can be, how you, if for the future case, how uh, you should measure this one. That uh, how much, what the process can be followed. That how this sedimentation and this uh, reservoir capacity will uh, change or something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, for that question, so sedimentation originally because of erosion. So there are uh, two forces. The climate is the uh, active forces. And then the uh, another one is the uh, passive forces, uh, the uh, topography, yeah, soil, yeah, soil cover and the soil characteristic. So the, uh, the climate change that really affect the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the sediment, yeah, that really affect the sediment uh, uh, with the uh, in, ex, increase of uh, extreme rainfall and the uh, extreme runoff. So when uh, there is an extreme rainfall, extreme runoff, so the uh, uh, this active force uh, will uh, uh, generate more erosion in the catchment, yeah. So the uh, starting from uh, what we call splash erosion, splash erosion from the uh, rainfall, and then uh, uh, move to the sheet erosion. So we can uh, estimate as the uh, what we call USL yield, cinnamon yield. So with the uh, uh, increase in erosivity due to the rainfall, and uh, because of the uh, type of the soil, erodibility, and we said uh, the lack of uh, catchment management. Yeah, so there are uh, coefficient there, and this will uh, increase yeah, the rate of sediment in the catchment. And also, if we uh, look at the uh, uh, sediment transport, for example, the bed load material and the suspended load, so in the river. So with the high runoff, yeah, with the uh, high runoff, it will uh, generate more easily yeah, the transportation of uh, uh, sediment material, especially the uh, suspended load and the uh, final material. Yeah, also the cost material will be uh, easier. Yeah, will be faster. So this will. Uh, uh, increase the uh, amount of uh, sediment 
So the sediment from uh, upstream will be easily uh, transported and it will uh, enter the reservoir. So we'll fill up the rate of filling will be uh, faster because of the climate change. Yeah. Okay, doctor. You, you need to switch. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's okay. Your volume, volume. Yeah, I yeah, understand. Okay. Understand. Thank you, Prof. Sopri. Understand this one that you want. This is, uh, uh, it will, sedimentation will increase and it will make, uh, reduce the reservoir, uh, reservoir dam capacity due to climate change. So one of the uh, critical questions, not critical question, is common question people want to ask that you told that different RCP scenarios, okay. So if some student want to do this uh, uh, climate change effect on sedimentation and dam capacity, so which RCP he should use? That, uh, what you suggest that which RCP he can, uh, because one question is that, what RCP for uh, scenario you suggest for Malaysia? I think they can up the, uh, the average. Yeah, okay. for Malaysia, okay. the average. Okay, yeah. so you think that you will do uh, different RCP and take the average one? Yes. It's okay, 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 thank you very much. So and another another question is there, uh, that question is asking something like that, that aging dam. Yeah. But, uh, what can be the effect of climate change? That can be more uh, vulnerable, become more vulnerable. This aging dam can become more vulnerable due to climate change. But what is your opinion? Yes, I believe that uh, the aging dam will be more vulnerable because uh, the aging dam, they receive uh, long term. Yeah. So if you estimate based on the what, normally we use the burn, uh, okay. uh, the, the curve, uh, oh. that we can uh, estimate the uh, sedimentation amount in the reservoir based on the track efficiency. Uh. So when the reservoir, is a uh, aging reservoir, so it uh, will receive large amount of sediment, yeah, oh. filling up in the reservoir that will uh, reduce the uh, reservoir capacity, uh, the useful storage, yeah. Therefore, the um, uh, when uh, we have a problem of the, the climate change, uh, the climate change, uh, the extreme rainfall, so that we uh, have a problem. Uh, of the flood, yeah, because the uh, storage, uh, the reservoir storage cannot uh, accommodate the uh, uh, high flood, yeah. So the spillway cannot uh, uh, accommodate, uh, cannot is not sufficient to handle the high flood, high inflow from the uh, high rainfall, extreme rainfall. So it is uh, vulnerable, yeah. So the aging dam is. Will become more vulnerable. Okay, more vulnerable. Okay. 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 Thank. Uh, thank you, Prof. Sobri. If some other question, I'll come back to you again. Okay. Now I am going to uh, uh, engineer Enku uh, Ahmed Khalil. So this is uh, mostly due. You, uh, how we design because uh, that audience asked that uh, for the climate change. Okay. Climate change. This uh, Prof. Sobri told that sedimentation will be become more and uh, that dam capacity will uh, reduce more, something like that. How we try to manage this one, something uh, this, you design the dam based on longer period or you update that uh, uh, this, uh, this dam design time to time or something like that. How we manage this one? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think in, uh, in our design, yes. We definitely do consider the factor of extreme uh, rainfall event. Uh, currently, we've been using the PMP and the PMF approach to estimate the design flood for the spillway. And also, in uh, all, almost all our existing uh, dams, we take into consideration of PMF, especially in the standard of operation. But uh, I think when we talk about PMP, either we need to design up to PMP, the extreme, the most extreme case. It depends on many factors. Uh, maybe the size of the reservoir, the type, maybe the type of the dams, <coughs> location, and especially we need uh, to really need the risk, uh, what kind of uh, 
risk we want to impose on the people, especially on the downstream area. So I think uh, we, we need to take a few, maybe I give you some examples. Maybe we can see in the Batu Dam in center of Kuala Lumpur, we designed the, the dam up to the PMF, uh, PMP level, because we can see that uh, uh, when we uh, consider the PMP, it's good to have a, what you call it, an upper bound that uh, we can consider is almost uh, zero risk. Yeah, I think that's my, my, my answer. Okay, so you, you try to update that, uh, that PMP, those things you try to update. Well, what period do you take? 100 year or something like that? Return period? Uh, for all the dams, we now consider the, the, the PMP. Okay. For all the dams, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, there is uh, another question that is uh, dam capacity, this is reducing. Okay, so the same question. Same question come to other, that is, uh, what is the sedimentation rate? Okay, so different people talk about different things, different uh, values. Okay, so what about your opinion? What is the sedimentation rate that you think is Malaysia, something like that? I think, I think in our observation that this, the sediment rate uh, maybe depends on the, what can, uh, on the topography of the catchment, the soil, uh, Erodibility index, what kind of soil is there, uh, what kind of development in the catchment area. So this type of factor brings a uh, different rate of sediment. Uh, in my slide, we can see a different rate of uh, sediment, even though uh, Anandau and Pontian is not far from each other, but the sediment is uh, quite different. Yeah. Okay. So it's completely depend on the place to place, local local geography or topography yeah, and, yes, and activity. Yes. Okay, understand. So how how you monitor this uh, this sedimentation rate? Like that, uh, 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 Prof Sumi told that every year or every two years they measure in Japan, but in Malaysia, how frequently you measure this one? Uh, uh, now, so we uh, doing the survey, the bathymetric survey, uh, around three to five years. Three to five years. At most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, we have to sediment. Uh, we do sediment sampling on the on the river uh, yearly. Okay. So uh, in your uh, biodata, I read that you are monitoring dam safety, those things in uh, Malaysia. So yeah, yeah. it's a very important issue. So besides sedimentation, what what other issue you try to uh, check? Dam safety. What are the other issue you try to check? Uh, we like try to check something like that. You you may check all these things. Uh, we check all, 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 all the, 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 the structures or the components involved in the, uh, the dams. Uh, well, with aging dams, I think we need to look into the maintenance, how, how they are maintaining the, the, the dam. Because uh, we can see that in Malaysia, almost, I think maybe 70 to 80% of the dam is more than 50 years old. So the condition of the dam will depend on how they do their maintenance. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you propose some maintenance, something like that. That if some uh, dam is very vulnerable, okay, you found some dam are very vulnerable, mm -hmm. highly vulnerable. Okay, so uh, what type of measure you generally propose for that case? So something like that, bypassing those things. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, what what type of measure you usually try to? Uh, when we have something that involves uh, what kind of hazard it is. We uh, propose uh, maybe three conditions. Uh, short term plan, what must be done immediately or in the mid uh, or in the long, long, on the long run. And also, we uh, produce uh, what kind of uh, maintenance that could be done to, to lower the risk of this uh, hazard. Uh, so, it depends on, on what we found about the dam. Okay. Uh, Based on dam condition, you try to uh, propose some of the measures. Yes. Okay. Understand. Okay. Thank you very much. So, oh. we, if there is any other question, we can discuss again. Just I, I want to go to uh, Dr. Johnson because he already answered his, his presentation was question and answer. So, I, I believe most of the questions are answered, but still there are uh, some issues. Okay. Especially you told that uh, during uh, flood and extreme event, flood and drought, something. Uh, this uh, this is happening. Okay, this is affecting the dam. 
So how you, uh, especially for TNB dams, how you are managing those things? You, you told something, but you can elaborate a little bit that how you uh, manage these things, how we deal with this extreme event for uh, dam management. Okay. So I think uh, the question is related to the uh, high sediment inflows during floods. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for hydropower reservoirs, um, a lot of the uh, uh, plant design, uh, the hydro plant design as well as the gate designs are to cope with uh, uh, those flood volume uh, because uh, hydropower, as you know, need water to run the machine. Okay. So a lot of these times, uh, high sediment inflows uh, normally will get directly deposited uh, inside the uh, reservoirs. Uh, but we do notice that in some cases, some of the high flood uh, events, if they reach a certain level where uh, it is uh, required to be routed through a spillway, then uh, mm. the spillway gates or the uh, ungated spillway will then start to operate. So, but in most cases, uh, sediments that are uh, being flushed out during uh, a flood through a spillway, then those sediments are typically of very, uh, uh, what they call, uh, they are they are consist of clay and silt. Uh, not much of a sand, but clay and silt. Uh, so mechanism for uh, flushing during uh, a flood event, most of the older dams they do have, but they are not allowed to operate during high flood event because of the high heights. Uh, but if dams, which are the newer ones, which are equipped with flushing outlets, then they will operate uh, to flush those sediments before they get into the reservoir system. So the older ones, uh, uh, in brief, most of the sediments get deposited in the reservoir. Yeah. And uh, we handle with them uh, separately uh, when the time comes during the drier season. Uh, but the ones that are equipped with the uh, uh, flushing gates, uh, descenders, and so on, then they get operated uh, during a high flood where all are closed or they are being flushed out. Yep. So uh, this practice you follow for all the dams, of all of your dams? Mm, like I said, there are two approaches here. The older version dams, you can't do much. Okay. But these sediments get deposited in the reservoir. So finally, what you do, you just abandon that on if deposited, deposited something. Yeah, so, so if it gets deposited over time, as you can see just now, uh, uh, Dr. Aswin did show one of the reservoirs during the 2014 flood where the sediment comes into the reservoir and then uh, there's not much you can do because uh, it gets deposited in the reservoir at the upstream far end. So they don't even reach to the, the dam. Uh, so, so even you do flushing or so on, it might not be so effective. So, those uh, mitigation strategies works uh, differently for different dams of different uh, configuration. So, those for the older, older dams. So, sometimes they can't do much. They come in and they get stored. And then we manage that later. Okay. Uh, but for the newer ones, like I said, the newer dams which are equipped with uh, those. Uh, facilities like outlet structures, flushing, descenders, and so on, then they get operated when the flood event occurs to reduce the impact of sediment itself. Okay, understand. Okay, thank you very much. So another important question that is, uh, that is everybody can ask. One of the, uh, your, one of your article also, you, you identify some of the strategy to uh, minimize that sedimentation or something like that in Malaysia. So any of the strategy implemented here, in Malaysia, what is the long-term strategy or what strategy you find found in your research? Those are implemented here or uh, any any plan to implement? Yeah. Or is there any other strategy that are implementing in Malaysia? Yeah. Um, there can be a few. Um, for the older dams, uh, uh, first, we always start with the measurement first. The measurement of the volume, the inflow, the deposition rate, and the dam safety, all this we start to measure. So once that has been started, then uh, just now I showed one graph for Central Reservoir where then uh, we need to see it falls in which uh, range of the graph so that we can pick and choose uh, which strategy. 
I think those strategy doesn't vary much throughout the world, similar like what Professor Sumi has also mentioned. We have implemented measures like introduction of check dams. Um, the newer dams, which have high sediment loads, we have uh, integrated uh, some of the uh, flushing outlets and modification on the spillway to suit for sediment flushing or, or, or um, uh, venting, uh, uh, venting uh, density uh, current. So those are incorporated in some of the newer versions. Uh, but like I said, in the graph, I also showed about the first strategy for check dams, they are to tackle at the catchment. Right, so there are some uh, uh, discussion also with the local government agency on replanting and also to block those sediment before it enters the river system. So those are some of the strategies that were implemented for the worst case scenario dams, uh, similar like in Cameron Highland and so on. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also strategies which are on the uh, third uh, uh, section. Uh, which is to manage or remove the sediment from the reservoir. So those are quite expensive, uh, like dredging, excavation, and so on. So those are implemented at the lower part of the reservoir because now the sediment has already deposited in the, in the reservoir, and then not much uh, you can do. You can either do a wet dredging or dry dredging. So we plan uh, for the reservoirs to do uh, this kind of uh, approach, uh, but the problem of removal uh, of um, of sediments from the reservoir by dredging is, of course, the challenge is to get the place where to dump the sediment. The dumping the sediment is always a big uh, challenge. Where to find a place to go and store all the sediment? But again, some reservoirs we have designated areas to do this. So, so it depends on each reservoir. So some are at the catchment area mitigation, like check dams and so on. And for the lower range, it's more on the dredging approach and uh, excavating approach. Uh, there were some uh, uh, approaches that uh, we have looked at on bypass tunnel. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I was there with, uh, with Prof Sumi in the uh, sediment bypass at uh, Switzerland. So during that conference, uh, we do share a lot on uh, flushing, but unfortunately, in order to install a bypass tunnel, it also involves a big cost. Mm -hmm. So if you are talking about uh, uh, sediment load, which are extremely high, then a bypass tunnel will work. But uh, for uh, sediment load, which are quite on the average and moderate, it is quite challenging to get the uh, implementation of the bypass tunnel in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe that's the future when uh, things get a bit more but definitely there's a there's an option to approach in that direction okay just i'm asking both of you uh, uh, engineer khalil and also you just um, this is my question is there dam breaching happen in any time in malaysia what is the statistics of that one dam break or something is happen in malaysia anytime okay. i think dam dam breach is a sensitive uh, uh, issue for all stakeholders mm -hmm. yeah so as you know, we are not so open about this information in the international or even national. Okay, okay, okay. They do, they do occur. They do occur. Whether the scale of it, whether it's big or small. Okay. Uh, but we haven't seen uh, a large event for hydropower dams. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's always important to safeguard all these dam safety parameters before any such event occurs. Okay, understand. It's okay. So. Uh... Uh, Engineer Khalil, I want to ask you this one. This, if some dam uh, break happen, how the sedimentation will change? Something in upstream and downstream, it, there will be very high impact of this sedimentation if some breaking happen? Uh, I think the sedimentation will, will definitely impact on the, the risk of dam failure. Uh, there, there is a higher risk of uh, maybe in case of overtopping and all that. Mm -hmm. But we try to look into uh, in, in every dam that we changes on the maybe on the standard operation manual mm -hmm. that we uh, say in the month we are expecting flood that we uh, eventually lower down earlier. Uh, that, that, that's kind of method we try uh, to prevent them failure. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. So I'm coming back to uh, Prof Sumi. 
talk to me because uh, uh, they talked about that uh, measurement, what strategy measurement uh, Malaysia taking or, or what they are thinking, something like that. So what what you think, what you propose this this for this reason because this reason is especially Southeast Asia land use changes going on very rapidly due to economic development and other things, also climate change. So in this situation, what what your suggestion, what strategy they should uh, follow to okay. uh, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm very much like uh, happy to have uh, uh, very much like uh, uh, valuable information from Malaysian side. I'm very much like uh, impressed uh, all presentation and the information. So maybe this is a good start to share, uh, especially like uh, Jensen, you showed the, the graph. Yeah, that is like a, like a fast start, starting point yeah. to understand the situation. Yes. And uh, we can, each project or each dam reservoir, we more look into the detail, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we, we would like to start. And additionally, I'd like some uh, like additional comments. Um, so hydropower uh, turbine, uh, sometimes uh, even in Japan is uh, a turbine owner do not like sediment input. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because average is sometimes critical, yeah. but the stage is slightly changing. Game is changing now. Yeah. So hydropower uh, should uh, take some some part of sediment mm. passing through through turbine by uh, like uh, enforcement by the like uh, turbine coating yes. and also some like uh, uh, bridging with the sediment deposition part as how to intake, how yeah. to take some like a uh, some some like a uh, route. So, because water is a more important yes. uh, for future climate change issues. Yeah. So, water shape also very much important. So, how to optimize total system, reservoir sediment management and the pen stock turbine management and the uh, uh, operation management and environmental issues should be combined all together. Yeah. And how to find the total like uh, optimum uh, solution that is important. So we are now start the discussion about the turbine company, what kind of like a concentration, what kind of sediment grain size can be safely passing right? like that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That is the one point. And in that regard, downstream issues also should be combined. Downstream means a river uh, manager, uh, river control, uh, flood control, and the uh, water intake from the downstream like water intake structure, a drinking water uh, company or something like that and the environmental, like uh, expert group. Mm. So high concentration discharge sometimes very much like a, a negative impression <laughs> to the downstream. Yeah. The sediment itself is a source of the environment. Yeah. So how to like uh, optimize upstream, downstream, it's very much like uh, nowadays also we are doing. We have a, a good society, civil and uh, ecology uh, society like that. Civil engineer and ecological engineer, like uh, engineer, engineer, ecological special uh, specialist should be uh, discussed all together. Yeah. Mm, that is the uh, next point. Like last point is, uh, uh, yeah, Japan is now is a government or a JICA or a company is a very much like a, uh, mm, try to do some like upgrading technology, existing dams. So for example, to make uh, some new bottom outlet yeah. or a new flushing outlet in, in exist, uh, existing uh, concrete dam. That is uh, like high technology needed Sorry. with keeping the, how to make a hole. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's kind of like technology is now very much key for <laughs> yeah. like a uh, flood control objectives, uh, increasing the flood capacity and the sediment passing through uh, many, many like uh, issues to be included. Yeah. yeah, those issues we, we should we should discuss. Yeah, thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you, thank you. I need to add to that, uh, prop, uh, maybe on the coating technology, yes, uh, some of the newer type of designs of uh, pen stocks as well as for the turbine, mm. uh, those parameters uh, need to be studied, well. particularly in the case of where high sediment volumes are noticed in the hydropower. So that uh, we have implemented so such things in uh, visualize scheme and so on. Yes, and so the other the other one that you are talking about on uh, incorporating that is uh, dam modification uh, to handle uh, flood. So it could be it could be done, but then again it's a it's a costly affair. So 
the volume and also the uh, lifespan of the dam needs to be justified and the benefit needs to be justified. Then those definitely uh, will, will be uh, looked at as an option. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. So uh, now, Prof, so just uh, uh, can you uh, just summarize, give us some message, just uh, uh, what you want to tell, any anything, any some message, just uh, some concluding remark you can make? Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. So, uh, what should be done about this climate change effect? How it can be mitigated or reduced? Something, so, um, major message, or uh, you can you can you can tell something. No? Okay. <laughs> so all the speakers, uh, they have a very good presentation. It's uh, very informative. Uh, but what I could summarize here that uh, there are three methods uh, of the erosion and sediment control. We can summarize here. First, we try to prevent the erosion from coming into the reservoir by good farming practice, bank stabilization, yeah? And then uh, the second, we uh, could prevent sediment from depositing in the reservoir. So that can be by a tunnel bypass, yeah? So, or can be uh, uh, check them around the reservoir. And then uh, the third one, uh, we can have a, a remove the sediment that has already deposited in reservoir. It could be by dredging or opening the gate, flushing the sediment through, but it uh, will costly. Yeah, what have been explained by Dr. Jensen, it is costly. Yeah. So now I think uh, we need a better sediment removal technology for future generation, because in future I believe that uh, the sediment is growing. Yeah, the problem every year. So we perhaps we need to solve now because in future. Uh, they will be more expensive and more difficult. So with the um, climate change, it will uh, generate, it will drive, uh, I believe that more sediment will be produced, deposited in the reservoir. Okay, okay. so. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, now, uh, Engineer Khalil, can give some uh, message to our audience? That hopefully I think what we need now is a sustainable solution rather than we take a short-term solution because, because of the cost. Maybe we need to some uh, work together, all the parties work together, maybe with all the dam owners, all the, uh, maybe the, who use the catchment, maybe the plantation or the communities that, that needs to evolve in this, uh, how to resolve the sediment. And especially I want to, uh, increase what you call increase in the public awareness of what we are facing right now, rather than the old, just the, the dam owner and the authority. Yeah, I think that's all. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. A lot of sharing uh, and interest uh, in terms of sedimentation is there. Um, I did uh, mention uh, later part of my slide that uh, we do need a participant to join our technical uh, committee for sedimentation in reservoirs. They will be part of uh, my coal uh, initiative to represent the data set for Malaysia. I think Prof Sumi also have a lot of interest in getting uh, those data set to be published also in ICO. Uh, but unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, research has been done on rivers, but uh, very few on reservoir. The reason is because uh, to do a Betty survey for reservoir is not cheap. It is expensive and uh, it needs a lot of uh, investment uh, to gain this. But I think now uh, we have seen JPS also have shown uh, interest in uh, getting these data to take care of uh, the welfare of their reservoirs as well. So I think um, I'm very much looking forward so that we can at least start uh, compiling all this information uh, in terms of how these uh, sediments are affecting uh, a lot of reservoirs. For, for, for hydropower reservoirs, uh, uh, Aswin and myself, we have been uh, doing this for the past 10 years to collect all the information we, we can on sedimentation. So we got a good data set ready for hydropower reservoirs. We definitely want more participants from JPS as well as other uh, individuals who are in the other industry uh, in terms of water supply, irrigation, and so on. So we can definitely have a se separate session if you are 
you all can join the committee. We can uh, arrange uh, to discuss more on specific uh, information on sediment. Uh, then uh, upon those things, then maybe there can also be a joint session to share what can be done in order to mitigate the sediment. Oh. Uh, but if those data collections are not done uh, uh, now, uh, unfortunately, it will be business as usual, and we might be solving issues case by case. Wow. So if you are there, I'm glad and happy to share some of the mitigations that uh, we have gone through, uh, that we have studied. Uh, we can have a, a, a good uh, long-term relationship in order for uh, managing of sedimentation in Malaysia. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. It's a very good method. So nobody wants to share data, but you, you told that you want to share data. It's a very good one. So finally, I had to come, uh, Prof. Sumi. So uh, you, I am uh, expecting some concluding remarks, some messages that we can take home from you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, okay, okay. Very much a like, uh, wonderful uh, organization and the presentation and sharing the information. Yeah, it's a good time to discuss. But uh, anyway, reservoir sedimentation is uh, very much like a key for uh, long-term issues. And we sometimes call the generation equity uh, yeah, this is a, we, we should uh, like a uh, handle uh, uh, to the uh, safe and uh, good function dam reservoir for the next generation. So that is a very much important message, and uh, maybe Malaysian people is uh, uh, already started and, and uh, sharing the information. But uh, not only Malaysia, we like share the ASEAN country and the global. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all presenter. Now I am passing it to that uh, chairperson, uh, Dr. Kogila Vani, he will conclude. Yeah, so, okay. okay. Okay, you want to tell something? Dr. Yeah, I, think, I hope that could you convey the uh, invitation to uh, Dr. Professor Sumi about the uh, conference. WR, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, I would like to uh, convey the invitation from okay. uh, the chair chairman of uh, ICW, our International Conference of Water Resources. So he would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sumi as one of the keynote speaker. So okay. I hope you accept <laughs> Dr. Sumi the invitation. Yeah. So so maybe there will be one conference in the end of this year. Yes. Yeah. Uh, international Conference for Water Resources, is it? Yeah. yeah. So organized by UTM. So Prof. Sobri, uh, or also chairman of that committee, no, I'm not a chairman. The chairman is not, not Prof. Sobri. Prof. Sobri is chief advisor. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. He's a chief advisor and uh, chairman also inviting you to be a keynote speaker of that one. So yeah. uh, if you kindly accept that invitation, they will be happy. That, uh, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm now passing it to uh, Dr. Kogila Vani. Dr. Vani. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Samsidesai, for moderating the event. It was very fruitful and engaging. We had tons of questions coming in, and there's still more questions. Uh, so for those who uh, we did not manage to answer the questions for now, please worry not. Uh, we will personally be contacting all the panelists with the questions, and we will get back to you uh, with very detailed answer. And also many thanks to panelists, Professor Dr. Tetsuya Sumi from uh, Water Resource Research Center, Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Institute, Kyoto University, Japan. Prof. Dr. Sobri Harun from Department of Water and Environmental Engineering, School of Civil Engineering, UTM Johor. Engineer Anku Ahmad Halil Azhar Anku Muhammad from Design and Dam Division, Department of Irrigation and Drainage, Malaysia, JPS. Engineer Dr. Jensen Lewis Alexander and Dr. Azwin from uh, Engineering Services, TNB, Power Generation, Sri Rambrahat, for your sharing of experience, knowledge, and uh, a lot of insights. Um, and uh, should any of the members of the uh, virtual floor would like to have more information about this program, uh, which is uh, offered under the Master of uh, Disaster Risk uh, Management MDRM course, please do not hesitate to contact us. And uh, we also have received a lot of uh, requests uh, if we could share the slides. Uh, so to answer to that, I will check with all the panelists. Uh, and uh, once we have uh, their consent, uh, we will disseminate these slides. And also keep a look out for the comprehensive report of this uh, webinar. And uh, that's all for now, I think. As the saying goes, to every beginning, there's an ending. 
And now the webinar has now come to an end. Once again, thank you everyone for gracing our webinar with your presence. We truly appreciate it. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to apologize if we have done any mistakes throughout the webinar. I end my duty as the master of ceremony today. Uh, with this event with saying thank you very much. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Peace out. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.